Greetings and welcome to the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop New Play Reading Series. Special thanks to the Billy Holiday Theater for partnering with us to make this reading possible. There'll be no intermission with this play. Immediately following this reading, there'll be a moderated critique session where you can offer direct feedback about what you've just watched to the playwright. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Garland Thompson, Jr., Executive Artistic Director of the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop. Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on which coast of the, this great nation you're on, whether the East Coast or the West Coast. As Kimberly just said, my name is Garland Lee Thompson, Jr., and I'm the Executive Artistic Director of the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop. 50 years ago, my father, Garland Lee Thompson Sr., along with Morgan Freeman, Billy Allen Henderson, and Clayton Riley, four of them got together and started the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop as an answer to a need they all felt and saw in their community at that time, which was a space, a safe space, an honest space where Black writers, writers of color, female writers, women writers, Play, uh, writers of different genders, different persuasions could come and share their work and get an honest reaction and honest feedback. In the 50 years that the workshop has been in existence from the very first reading in October of 1973 with playwright Ray Arena's Sister Sister to today's reading of the Black Bullet Dichotomy, it has been a long, storied, and exciting journey, one that we're happy to continue forward. That said, we also want to let you know that it is our 50th anniversary. And so with this reading, we are kicking off our 50th anniversary celebrations. Ironically, though, we find ourselves in an interesting position because the very first reading happened in October of 1973 at the Martinique Theater. And, to, uh, and however, the company itself did not receive its actual nonprofit status until 1975 when it was proclaimed by the city and the state. So we find ourselves with an interesting opportunity in that we have two 50th anniversaries. So what we're going to do is we're combining the two. And so we're starting the celebrations now in 2023, and they will be ramping up and building up as we go through the next two years into 2025. I don't want to say anything more right now because we're still developing the whole thing, but you'll be hearing more from us. You can stay in touch with us via our socials on Facebook. We are on Instagram as well and Twitter, and you can reach out to us via our website at thefsww.org. And I'd like to say a thank you very quickly to our partner, the Billy Holiday Theater. Without them, we couldn't be here with you today. So we are very much in love with them, speaking of love. And also want to thank Zoom Catchers, the team at Zoom Catchers, for handling all of the technical responsibilities for live streaming today's reading. They are a wonderful team, and we are so happy to be partnering with them. That said, we look forward to bringing you more of these readings. Next month, we have our next reading, which is called Witness. It is by playwright Dorothy Marsick and directed by Kimberly Lamarck Orman and also starring Roscoe Orman, the man himself. So that'll be coming up on March 5th at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to find out more or if you'd like to get involved, if you'd like to help us celebrate in any way, if you have an idea, a thought, anything that you'd like to share with us, you can reach out to us through our website, bfsww.org, and we'll be happy to reach out to you and have a conversation. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to present our first reading of our first 50th anniversary. So without any further ado, I don't want to hold things up because I know we are waiting to see this show. I'm very pleased to present The Black Bullet Dichotomy, written by David Stamps and directed by Eric Jordan Young. The Black Bullet Dichotomy, Act 1, Scene 1, at Rise. Lights dim. A lone figure lies on a rollable table still. The blank stage is reminiscent of a lobby of an emergency room as it crackles with tension. Lights up, the poetess, a cool and all-knowing poet in an Afrocentric caftan, breathes heavily. She's nine months pregnant and about to give birth. A hard-hitting hip-hop beast bursts into the ear. This song is Black Rob's like, whoa. Oh, 
Oh, oh, oh. Just like that, with the cosmic snap, you're on the other side where hip hop meets the twilight zone. Whatever worthiness ish, this is what we on. You're about to take a mystical, musical, messianic ride. Me and the poetess, your all knowing narrator for the night, also the wise woman up in this piece. And you know what I find? There are three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the truth, or the other side. A pocket of space and time where hip hop overcomes reality and the universe is all the better for it. Today, I'm taking you to the other side of Queens, New York, St. Albans to be exact. The point of the fact, there appears to be a dichotomy Two mutually opposed contradictions like the truth and the fiction to this very story. The truth, the heckler, a vital poet, must learn his worth to mint his ways, for no man shall know when the end time shall come of his days. Now, I'm going to snap my fingers and allow a spiritual fire to ignite, to give us a little hip hop as we glide into this trippy night. So, upright bass halts abruptly. She snaps her fingers. The music for like, whoa, begins again. In the ghetto, you find yourself having things you need to know. <laughs> Yo, this is a tell of, whoa. whoa, when this man dies, you're gonna be like, whoa. so, whoa, like, here whoa. we whoa. go. Like, whoa, like, whoa, like, whoa. Lights out. Scene two. Morgue silent. Downstage right in front of a curtain is a sign that says the holistic hood. A bell chimes. We hear odd store music reminiscent of the brand new heavies fade as lights raise. It's a store of African artifacts. The shop boasts a single exotic self-standing mask to present its wares. His t-shirt reads, the beloved shopkeeper. He stands behind a cash register with his hands in the air. The heckler, known by his cap, is a volatile poet aiming a gun at the beloved shopkeeper's heart. He stands deathly still. Cashew, his nutty friend, stands just behind him. Cashew looks on. Heckler, the gun's not loaded. I'm telling you the beloved shopkeeper has PTSD. Just pull the trigger and he'll fold, you'll see. I've pressed a silent alarm. Leave here now while you still done no harm. I'm telling you both, please leave before you become another victim of the black bullet dichotomy. What will you be worth to your son if you lose your life toying with a gun? The heckler lowers the gun. What the fuck am I worth if I can't save my son? It ain't up to me, OG. My seed's gonna have what he need. The heckler shoots the beloved shopkeeper dead. The heckler is shocked. Where's the Where's gun? Where's the gun? Where's the fucking gun? Cashew smiles with a sadistic glee. Cashew tries the safe lock to no avail. Your gun was loaded and his safe's locked. We got to get out of here now before we get clocked. Police sirens blare in the distance. Uh, Cashew, I don't understand. The gun wasn't loaded. Why did I just kill this man? What have I done? What will become of my son? There's a poetry spot around the corner called Spoken World Cafe where we can hide. Hurry up. This man has been giving us free back to school backpacks since we was nine. Come on, follow me. And what in the fuck is a black bullet dichotomy? Scene three. The head off stage curtains open. A self-standing traffic light is center stage. An orange traffic cone marks the curb. A traffic light shows red. The poetess stands next to the heckler, though he doesn't see her. Melancholy, jazz with a wild clarinet, dances through the air. This poor misled young poet, the heckler, caught in the crosswalk of life where the light is red, but he refuses to stop to think. But until he understands his worthiness, this tall, cool glass of water is going to continue to heat up. And he's going to still have to drink. See, he just murdered a man he did not intend to. Oh! The heckler stands in the center of the crosswalk as the red light turns green. The heckler stretches out his arms as though he's on the cross. Sacrificial lamb, or the great I am? And his frenemy, Cashew, with an axe to grind. He set him up so cold, he must want to see the heckler dead or doing time. Cashew stands on the invincible curb. 
He looks at the heckler with mock concern. The car is red, but the heckler doesn't move. Horns hawk without ceasing. You were in the middle of the crosswalk, yo, and the light is green. Man, these cars want to go. Cashew hustles the heckler against his will across the street. Once the heckler's back is turned, Cashew smiles with a sadistic glee. A sign reads, the spoken world cafe, spoken word. Everyone will be heard. Cashew and the heckler enter the hole in the wall club. It is true. A grave injustice has occurred, and as in each tragedy, there's a lesson to be learned or unlearned. The questions, how did we come to this eve in need of such an epiphany? Well, that is what you have come to see. As for me, I'm about to join the tale, and when in play, I'm plain old me. So unfortunately, or fortunately, the other side has all the answers the heckler will ever need in this ironic tragedy entitled The Black Bullet Dichotomy. Scene four. The spotlight on the poetess turns blue. She walks to the door where a red velvet rope divides the door from the club. The music shifts to a driving mid-tempo hip-hop beat. A chair sits at the entrance where the ticket taker now sits in front of a closed curtain. She's an aggressive 19-year-old tomboy type young lady. Behind the curtain club, environment replete with carryaway props, Spoken World Cafe. Center stage is an elevated stage complete with a mic and a mic stand, dead center. A payphone that sits at the right of the bar on Chill by Wale with the vocalist Jeremiah on We've Been on a Tragedy for Months. It plays in the background. The bar, center stage left, downstage right, is an imaginary bathroom with a simple full-length mirror to declare its existence. In front of the closed curtain, the ticket taker addresses the poetess. She's next. From the back of the theater, a ruckus is heard as the heckler and Cashew enter. The spotlight follows them. Music transitions into murder is the case that they make it. Murder is the case that they make it. Getting marked is the chance that they take it. That's why claiming was the fool ride, and you know you the faking. Man, they trying to treat me like I'm a psychic. The heckler jumps the rope, cutting in front of the poetess. She trips him. Everyone coughs. <laughs> <laughs> The heckler gives her a murderous glare. He points his hand in the shape of a gun directly at her and puts the imaginary gun to his own head. Click. Trick. The heckler runs into the club. The poetess charges in after him, unafraid. The ticket taker at the door walks to the curtain, which is now opening. Cashew grabs her pen and writes their names on the list and puts the pen and the pad back. Heckler, Cashew, yo, you? The ticket taker turns abruptly, very annoyed. Miss, we own the list. I don't know where your friend thinks he is. The ticket taker checks the list and finds their names. It's a little suspect, but whatever. The ticket taker watches the heckler as he bulldozes through some people and not without some pushback. Look, I really don't have the time. And you are the last person in line. The ticket taker makes eye contact with security, a trigger happy fellow. She leads his eyes to the heckler, now checking the payphone coin slot for change. Let's just keep a low profile. Let the heat die down for a while. We supposed to be lying low. The ticket taker whispers something in security's ear. Security turns to the heckler, barely missing him stealing a tip off the bar. I know. Snatching tips off the bar. Come on, star. What you think? I'm flat broke and I need a drink. Cashew throws his hands up in the air and marches away disgusted before security can react. We hear a glass crash in the back. Security darts off stage. Out comes the very distracting waitress, a young sister that puts you in the mind of Josephine Baker. The security returns. She picks up a tray, then dons on an apron as she walks past security. Oh, <laughs> you really be taking me there. I gotta see you about as fine as frog hair. The waitress gives him a coquettish smile. The heckler addresses the waitress. Pardon, garçon. You speak French? Oh, joy. Just for the record, garçon means boy. And I'm a girl, as you can plainly see. Well, whoever in the fuck you be, one Long Island iced tea. The waitress rolls her eyes, then fetches his drink. The security takes note. I didn't hear what you just said, but talking greasy to the staff will get you tossed on your head. 
You want to give me head? Nah, but send your moms over to give me some instead. <laughs> a security guard advances on him. The premier poet, a deep singer poet, grabs the security. Yo, man, yo, we got an emergency in the back. I need your attention. And when you come back, give black man some slack. If it goes too far, I'll handle that. And that's fact. We hear a glass shatter in the back. We ain't done. One, but playing the dozens with your moms was fun. Scene five. The security can barely walk away. The waitress returns, then gives the heckler his drink. The heckler drinks it down in one gulp, but manages to knock over the waitress' whole tray of drinks. Music transitions into a neo-fusion jazz heavy loop as the waitress points her hand in the heckler's face and silently cusses him hard. She moves with the transition to pick up the drinks. The heckler walks away oblivious. I just heard from my cousin, and basically what she said, the beloved shopkeeper has been shot down dead. Premier's devastated as he takes the stage. The band transitions into I Really Miss You, Brandy, by the OJs. The lyrics are now I Really Miss Real Poetry, written by David M. Stamps. It's your man's premiere. And I've been told, though it is hard to believe, that the beloved shopkeeper has been murdered by a bullet on this very eve. Oh, I fucked her. It's a shame such a tough as nails pillar has fallen in our community. So a moment of silence, please, as we bow our heads to pray for his family. Premier breathes into the microphone. Everyone bows their heads except the heckler. He's looking really guilty and upset. The patrons of the club raise their heads. I pose this question to you tonight. If you live by the gun, how do you die? Especially if you're Black. I pray this murderer be brought to justice. So on tonight, I devote this. Sitting by the fireplace is my favorite DVD. A humble few bars of a melody, and it sounded sweet to me. I thought I'd get up and put some lyrics down, but the beat got in the way. I tried to hit some more as it fell to the floor. It occurred to me. You know what I need? I need to hear some real poetry. His worthless ass is as meek as a lamb. He'll leave here death by cop if things go to plan. And he'll take the blame with him to the grave for this 187 man. And he has yet not a clue at all that it is me who has orchestrated his fall, have sex with my girl on a trash can container? We supposed to be like brothers and you treat me like a stranger? <clears throat> well, let's keep everything on track. As a matter of fucking fact, I ain't giving his ass no slack. Cashew leads the heckler into the bathroom. Scene six, bathroom. Cashew and the heckler are eye to eye. Pamir is under a blue light. My muse is gone, I feel so alone. I really miss real poetry. Say, is everything copacetic, cat? But don't call me that, I ain't no cat. All right then, dog, why you letting your mind lead you into this fog? How can I make it through this day? I am losing it trying to find my way. There's no way I can do what it seems I've done. Listen, son, denial ain't just a river out in Egypt just because it got a lot of black folks in it. Just hold up a minute. You're going to fuck around and get your jewels knocked in the dirt. Now, that's going to hurt. Bromi, you know we better than that. I can't let you go out like that. Look, I don't know where your head is at, but disrespecting expecting queens, that's not where it's at. Look, I know this situation seems hopeless, and you could be a better father if you weren't homeless, then your son wouldn't have so much beef on these streets and you, maybe you could help him with his ADHD. Homie, I don't know what you're trying to say, but my son, they will not medicate. They will this just must bring back memories of your dad's dying day. Damn, dog! 
Your old dude did die from gunplay and he was a Don. Gunplay is an oxymoron, moron. And my son may have problems, but everybody knows what's up with his dad. I hitting all the pretty biddies all over the city, no matter who they man's is. Yes. Yeah, but <laughs> damn, if you wasn't so foul right now, both of our pockets would be fat. Would you think of someone beside yourself? Up until now, I would have sworn that you loved yourself. If you implicate me, that would be bad for your health. And cuz if you breathe a word to a soul. I don't know who you think you can control. Whatever endeavor you deem clever, if the man had a gun, I, I wouldn't right now be losing my mind and no one would be dead, son. Thug the dumb shit. Let the punishment fit the crime. See, I thought you was cool, but you're that other brother. And I ain't got time for hating imitators just like last night. I ain't have the time to keep finessing your mother. Cashew charges him. The shoving match gets serious. The heckler pulls out the gun, holding it sideways like a Hollywood novice. The heckler smiles coldly. Cashew whispers a coach over the heckler. That thing has a body. Whatever death wish you're on this night, you've earned it. You done played yourself and say even a thug knows when a nice foolery leads to his dying day. The heckler puts the gun to Cashew's head. Where is the gun? Where is the fucking gun? Don't worry about it, bitch. <laughs> what kind of knucklehead brings a murder-heavy pistola to a night of spoken word? Oh, some needy motherfucker just dying to be heard. But you trying to make a name out on these streets is absurd. That's my word. Cashew leaves the bathroom. The heckler looks down the barrel of his gun then into the mirror. Ah, oh, death. Where is thy sting? But my seed, how can I face him with his name now a mockery? But how will he make it without me? His incredible destiny, at least. Allow me to understand, I pray. I'll let no more loved ones go out this way. Would that I could somehow save my son so that it never visits another loved one again. Would that I could save my son the fearing from our plans. Blood of an innocent elder on my hands. Lights drop to an ominous blue on the heckler. Scene seven. Lights raise, bright white on premiere poet. Steps on stage as a wicked hip hop loop takes over. Good evening, lyrics loving gents and ladies. As always, we come together in the name of peace. Here at the Spoken World Cafe, every soul has their say, so respect the poets, please. Embrace their lyrical release as they come on and do their thing. This is a night of spoken word and never one will be heard. I got a young queen with a heavy lyric on her chest. I honor the first poet of the night, a palm offering to help me welcome the poetess. A neo-fusion jazz beat. Premier leaves the stage and then helps the poetess take it under the white light. Just breathe. <laughs> My fatherless child will never need a gun. He's another black widow's son. My man was a thug and I thought that was fly. But when he died in my arms, I had to ask myself why? While pondering future questions like, mama, why did daddy have to die? Just breathe. Scene eight, illuminated by a red volatile light. The heckler has gotten into a staring match with security. Security pulls back his blazer to reveal a gun. The heckler sucks his teeth. Ooh, 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 ooh. The only bullets my son will use to make his way will be to highlight his employable resume. He will avoid danger. He won't be the fool who does Sister, if you his... raise your boy like that, he's going to be a punk. <laughs> he will attend a college of his peers. Where he'll be lost to himself for years. 
He will meditate, deliberately create, consciously procreate, be pure mandingo concentrate. And still his eyes will sing the song of we hate. You know, y'all are really about to piss me off. This fool is about to straight up play himself out. There's no need to warn me again. I've been told of the price to be paid. Even a fool knows when a night's thuggery leads to his dying day. He will chief asphalt reservations and brave hate-filled jeers. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, he'll still be lacking in here. Why you stand there beating your chest? Show his sister some respect. The whole crowd's behind her. The security guard pounces, but the heckler dodges him. That's exactly why I'm here. It's high time a brother caught your ear. You remind me of the gangsters who took his father away. I was enlightened on that very day. But this young prince, no heat packet punk will ever disassuade. Living by the gun has taken so many real men to their early graves. Real men, huh? I'm so sick of being considered less than, son. All points bulletin for an African-American male. The hecklers gunned down the shopkeeper and the camera tells the tale. The second youth known as Cashew loaded the gun behind the heckler's back. He was none the wiser. Both youth seemed to think the bullet's the great equalizer. Retribu retribution against them both is what we're seeking. <sighs> but people, the suspect known as the heckler is to be pursued with deadly force for he is harmed, armed, and lethal. The heckler eyes Cashew as if seeing him for the first time. Everyone looks at them the same way. Of course. That's why there was more in the clip. I, I must have been in shock to not see it. I saw you empty it. We were only supposed to scare him, then rob him. That's what you said. So you get this through your head. You gonna clear my name. That's just how it is. Me doing a bid for this, that's just a glitch, a, a glitch, a, a glitch in the matrix. Ray, this about a bitch. This shit's rich. He was a snitch. He was about to get my brother locked up in the thing, that little tryst you had with my girl. Yeah, I know about a player. It rocked my world, so I got to thinking. Two birds, one stone. The heckler cocks the pistol. Two dogs, one bone. Maybe I should just finish you off right now, B. I thought your beef was with me. Please don't get further entwined in the black bullet dichotomy. Again, with this notion of the black bullet dichotomy. Why can't our men brandish weaponry? Why do sisters have to enforce old master's philosophy, teach him to fear his own, assimilate cave mentality? I Place soon as such a story gets free. Treacherous bastard. This would be a damn good time to breathe. The heckler, Cashew, and the poetess breathe together. Then the crowd breathes. Security then breathes from sheer exhaustion. Come on, homie. I'm begging you, please. Why did not like this you bound to bring down the heat? Listen to the poetess, please speak your piece. The security guard stops and points his gun. Bigger you barge in disrupting a sister rendering word? My dude, this shit is absurd. But you straight up today, you have been heard. The heard. Now, Bard, let's get this ridiculous situation resolved. Drop the nine and the popos need not be involved. Bigger just jettison the burner, then just walk away. Either that or leave out of here the other way. Security cocks his pistol. We hear a police siren outside. Is there... No bargain I can plead to wake me up from this nightmare-like dream. Besides, bullshit's never resolved. Not when that bitch Nina's involved because of a foolish shopkeeper I have devolved. You don't even know how to hold it, son. Bigger, your burner game is bum. You ain't got no business playing with no gun. I've been too busy playing with your mama's sweetest son. The security takes aim. The poetess arches her back and leans in to the heckler. Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? No. Her kisses were something I had to learn to live without. <laughs> That's all a part of this seriously dysfunctional drama. Watch what you say. That's still my mom. Approach me if you dare. I refuse to live in fear. What is it that you seek? 
Why do we murder the souls of our young? Oh, why does the blood of my ancestors still run? Why am I heir to the son who will die by the gun? That's the black bullet dichotomy. The poetess breathes, and then the crowd breathes. The security guard lets out an exasperated breath. Why am I so angry and confused? Why do I feel so used? Why is it even when I win, I lose? That's just reverse psychology. Why is it no one hears me until I have a gun? Why can't I make a decent home for my son? Does anyone see the good I've done? Universal law, bros, in the breeze. I feel like a, a king without a throne. And what about my native home? I can't do it all alone. But what about your immortality? <laughs> you speak to me of immortality? Plagues of locusts beset on me, accursed generations that continue on through my seed? The ego only perceives what spirit clearly sees. That's the dichotomy. Don't you see? I see. But what is the ego of which you speak? It's identifying only with this body, this vessel, and sane in every way. It goes from suspicious to vicious, only useful if used by the spirit in an intellectual way. Well, no wonder I feel all is lost. But is there no end to the pain I cause? I have found myself to be so lost. If murder be the gash, then let death be the gauze. There is only one course left to pursue. I must give the devil his due. The heckler places the gun to his head. Ladies gasp. The poetess pulls down the, his gun hand. The crowd goes wild. She no! places his free hand on the swollen belly. Silence. You and I and he, divine, our birthright transcends time. I stand before you willing to provide intervention. Life blesses us with the answers. Won't you honor me with the question? Did I commit the most heinous of sins? Sin is merely an acronym for self-inflicted nonsense. What you see as sin, merely a mistake. Just be glad that you've discovered the right path to take. How do I undo what has been done? Why is it so hard for the brethren that harness the sun? Why did I kill the beloved shopkeeper with this very gun? This will bring you to the state of satisfaction. Your alignment will lead to atonement because of the law of attraction. A white police officer bursts through the door. My finger is ready. My trigger is hot. What should I do? A voice over the walkie-talkie. Take the shot. The poet has put the gun to her own head, thinking they wouldn't dare shoot a pregnant woman. I'm trying to keep you with them from shooting you, baby. Surely they won't shoot at a pregnant lady. My spirit is yearning and the mic is hot. I'm holding the gun so you will take your shot. Don't let all this be for naught. The police officer aims the gun. Until now, I hadn't seen beyond my pain. And now that I see that my ego's insane, I feel I can be whole again. That is up to you. Forgive me, please, I beg of you. Um, full favor and forgiveness, but respect is earned. You want to cross over troubled waters, over bridges already burned? The God within must be churned. What has been learned must be unlearned. It's not just forgiveness you need for the bullet spent. Wayward traveler, you need to get into the sweet spot where you will find atonement. <laughs> the sweet spot. Now that sounds good. Then I have been misled and misunderstood. Misinformation has misled me down the road of misogyny. What hey me? Miss, not what I meant, but grant me atonement. <laughs> atonement will be realized unconditionally. If you do this one thing for me, set my ancestors free. My son's father fell prey to this depraved dichotomy. I want my son to bypass this culture-specific travesty. All strange fruit bear self-loathing seeds. I house confusion's legacy. In fact, I house two spirits presently. 
And they both cry out to me. I pray these, please expose the black bullet dichotomy. The heckler scratches his head with the gun. The police officer squeezes off a shot, but security pushes him back. Bam! We hear the shattering of a light fixture crash. Yikes, I've already got two strikes. He dashes off stage. Stage dark, the heckler's ringtone, Dance With My Father Again by Luther Vandross, please. Then another shot rings out, lights up. The heckler falls. Blood runs from his left temple, then from his right temple as well. Hold on, son. I'm calling 911. The paramedics are on their way. You will make it if you can just last the day. So hold on for dear life or all is lost. And if you fail, you know the cost. I, I will do what you ask of me. I I'll expose the... The heckler falls unconscious. Two EMTs enter. The ringtone ends. The chorus begins to moan over a gospel sample. The chorus starts moaning. A single female vocalist ad-libs over a gospel track. We hear the heart monitor beep incessantly. Then the heckler flatlines. The first EMT pulls out the imaginary cardiopulmonary resuscitators, rubs them together, then employs them. The heckler spasms, then lies deftly still. The female vocalist stops singing. One, two, three. Second pause. The heart monitor begins a faint, then stronger, steady staccato beat. Lights out. End of Act One. Act Two, Scene One. At rise. Lights dim. The air is thick with foreboding offstage salty. The poetess, unpregnant, now a spirit guide, narrates. We in Queens still, but it just got Jamaica Hospital real. The flight deck. This one's got a file. And if you ain't got insurance here, then you've got yourself a problem there. Guess who's got problems? Lights up on the heckler wrestles into his sleep. Last lights come up. We see the EMTs frozen. They come to life with the hip hop beat would burst into the ear dumb. His heart rate is stable, though I thought sure he was dead. Who makes it with a bullet hole straight through their head? Oh, this asshole. Oh, is my, this asshole, if my eyes serve me right, and if he makes it through the night, maybe he'll make it through this ish all right. The EMTs exit. Dr. Dunk, a white racist doctor in his late 50s. He smacks of trust fun baby. He follows Nurse Altright, a white racist nurse, ratchet wannabe, as they approach the heckler's bedside, totally breathed, of any manner. They hook him up to an imaginary breathing apparatus. Nurse Altright, hook him up to this fancy breathing machine until we get the call to find out if he has insurance at all. That's what determines his fate. He would want to have insurance for the expensive machine he needs, Dr. Dump. It's 77 cents a second to breathe, so we just need to wait. The phone rings. Nurse Altright answers it. I see. Unplug him. No one heals for free. Dr. Dump reaches for the imaginary breathing machine when a call comes over the loudspeaker. Great bullet strikes an innocent child in the head. By some miracle, she's not dead. We need you immediately, Dr. Dump and Nerve Osweig stat. And that, as they say, is that. They run off stage. Salty, the poetess, unpregnant, sashays in. I am no longer with child, but I'm here to hip you just the same. Though here, Swati's my name. I am spirit guide to lead this young poet through the most treacherous emotional terrain, his brain. I must lead him through the labyrinth of his unconscious mind, if he's ever to align, and he must, if his worthiness he's to, ever to find. Salty stands in front of the table above the heckler as he wrestles in his sleep. This story has taken a desperate turn. The heckler's desire for atonement, his heart does yearn. Since you started this day as a heckler to me, 
you now lie comatose before me. From here forth. With her index finger, she anoints the heckler as he lies, deftly still. The sleeper you will be. Come along, for there's much to be unlearned, too. The heckler has transformed into the sleeper. T-shirt states it. The sleeper awakens from a bad dream. <laughs> Expose the black bullet dichotomy. I am Swati, Swahili for voice. Here to calm your turmoil, silence the inner noise. Rise, seeker of knowing, embrace your destiny. If you ever want to be fee free, this is the face you chose, so follow my lead. Sati bids the sleeper rise. Scene two. The sleeper and Sati dance across the stage in a flirtatious manner. They come to a large, poorly made, odious sign, the plantation politic. We must get through the plantation politic. Then we get you in the sweet spot. We can get your sauce up. We must reach higher ground. Now quick, move rapidly through the plantation politic. Saucy uh, and the sleeper stoop. Then three careful steps upstage, Saucy coaxes the sleeper upstage as they stand in front of the curtain. I don't know what's up. Don't get me wrong. I'm as hype as can be, but where do I find myself presently? Utopia, Mississippi. The slave catcher, a burly man dressed in shabby clothes, limps toward him. Where are you going, boy? It's time for you to go back to the plantation to face your injustice for killing one of us. Uh, partner, don't make me deal with you the way they deal with us. He's the slave catcher, a slave who hunts after runaways who have broken free. And news of the beloved shopkeeper has spread throughout the community. You work for the man and you coming for me. I ain't sent for you, OG. If ain't nobody hip to you yet, we's free. As long as we keep killing each other, we will never be free. Now, come on, boy. You're bringing your ass with me. The slave catcher grabs the sleeper, but the sleeper puts a gun to his head. The slave catcher cringes. You may have won this time, but I'll be back. And next time, I'll be strapped. Well, if that's my fate, I should just kill you now. I mean, why wait? Sati, in sense, steps in between them. How dare you bring that deadly thing on hallowed ground? Have you learned nothing about misusing a gun? I am done. Leave him be. But he started it with me. Truth be told, now this is fact. If you live by the gun, you die by the gun. But especially if you black. The sleeper pulls the gun away from the slave catcher's head. You will die this day. So take it all in. Anyone can see you as guilty as sin. The slave catcher limps away, enraged and in a hurry. I have doubt. And I'm riddled with guilt. My sins are as deep as the ocean. Guilt's a toxic emotion. But guilt is necessary. Without it, people would just do anything. People do anything anyway. Guilt isn't meant to guide you on your way. It comes from fear. You must focus on love if you are ever to have peace. I still need my peace if I'm going to keep the peace, even if this is just a dream. If you die here, you also die in the real world. Don't be dumb. I think by now that you'd know about trying to saw up every little thing with a gun. I, I don't know. I, I guess. We'll see. That's gun so, in his pants. How will I unlearn this accursed dichotomy? You have to get a spiritual tune-up, if you know what I mean. No, I do not. In fact, when it comes to the sweet spot... I don't know what's what. So let's say I do get it. Uh, what do I do then? Above all else, you must feel good. Understood? One step at a time. Everything will be revealed to you. Sati begins to clap her hands and sway to the beat of the hand claps and foot stomps coming from the speakers. The ebullient harmonica wails her into his hips into action. It's about the sauce, the chemical reactions to the emotions you feel. 
You could say it's where your good feelings congeal. You can't get what you want until you get what you feel. Get your sauce up and you'll see the ancestors face to face. And then you can make your case. I get that. Yo, that's bad. And now that you get that, get this. Let's do it. <laughs> they two-step with the more and more intensity. What you appreciate, appreciates. Well, I appreciate the sway of your hips. I A purple light illuminates the gyrating couple. I appreciate the silky words from your lips. A pink light adds the purple light, and now they dance at a feverish pitch. What you appreciate does appreciate. The sleeper watches Salty dance, hypnotize. The current opens, and scene three. A sample of a harpstrom. These are spirits and martyrs who know of what you seek. They speak to a presence deep within your center. But there is one soul who will either heal or kill you. Yes, there's one soul in particular. But if you take the time to receive what spirit can give, your journey to worthiness will be fulfilled. A sample of a harmonica playing. The spirits of Tupac Shakur, shirtless in a bandana, hugs and then whispers to Josephine Baker in a silver flapper dress and a yellow feather hat. She giggles her response. Johnny Cochran in a 19th century dreadlocked barista wig, complete with his tights and big buckle shoes, and Harriet Tubman dressed in a 19th century dress with a button-up shoes, engage in a lively two-step. That there's a love seat backstage right and two chairs next to the bar, which is center stage. Here are the spirits who know of what you seek. Enlighten me, please. Safi takes his hand and they dance as she speaks. Johnny Cochran and Harriet Tubman halt their lively dance and create a semicircle around the sleeper and Salty as she speaks. They sway to the music. The mystical city of Utopia, Mississippi. It's a trip, the hippiest little enclave in all the sip. Where the ancestors and martyrs of the Black Bullet Dichotomy speak. So we're going to define the Black Bullet Dichotomy one word at a time, line by line, in rhyme. Miss Harriet Tubman, spirit woman, God Moses, please tell me what does Black mean to thee? Harriet Tubman stands and leans on her shotgun. They sway to the music as Miss Harriet speaks. Black is the tracks of the Underground Railroad where the ancestors led me and so many other souls. Black was the night of the mind when my spirit would sleep. Jesus watched over us while I slumbered deep. Uh, call me crazy, Harriet, but, but that's not what Black means to me. Black is my heart for the wrong I have done, all at the wrong end of a gun. The name is Ms. Harriet, son. And when I encounter the enslaved like you on the run, I put one of these under his nose just to keep him on his toes. Forgiving yourself and others will end all your woes. A tense three seconds as the music stops. Sati removes the shotgun from under his nose very cautiously. Are you telling me? that I must forgive those who have so wronged me? That's a part of the whole thing. It's sad, really. I know for myself the unwanted kisses sting, but forgiveness is still the best thing. The music resumes. Salty embraces the sleeper who's visibly upset. The spirit of Harriet Tubman dances to the other side of Salty as the spirit of Tupac Shakur turns and approaches Salty and the sleeper. Forgiving them is forgiving yourself. Everything you've done because of your confusion, you can watch it all melt. That's a vote for good mental health. The beatings were so commonplace and so ongoing, keeping me in a wounded state, stagnant, made it so hard to keep growing. And now I just say kumbaya, process it spiritually after all the shit they did to me. If you are ever to be free. Okay, so let's say... I do let go of what is holding me back. 
So they just get away with that? It just seems that they get off scot-free. Remember, they still feel guilty. It just releases you to make moves strategically. Oh, I see. That's the way it's supposed to be. So then there is hope for me. Yes, indeed. Now, powerful poet, please tell me, what does the bullet mean to thee? We make moves on our enemies. The spirit of Tupac approaches. Asking for my opinion and getting yours, come on, buck, buck, buck. It's like asking for some old Danny Hathaway and getting some new joints from Elvis. I mean, what's the fuck? Hold the fuck up. The ancestors are horrified. All lights go out. It's Salty and the sleeper under a spotlight. The music stops. Only a persistent but low conga is heard. Salty jumps in his face. You gonna make me whoop your butt. Now just shut up. When your vibration drops, you lose touch with a sweet spot. Now just stop. This man's a martyr. A martyr of the dichotomy shot down in his prime for the gift of poetry. At least hear the man out. Sati puts her fingers to his lips. She closes her eyes. The sleeper does as well. Positive by Erica Campbell creeps into the air. They rock and raise their hands in praise. Mm, Now we've got to get into the sweet spot. They rock and sway. Feeling good, feeling clear, feeling positive. Villain good, villain glare, villain positive. The pink and purple lights come up. They're back in the sweet spot. Swati motions for the spirit of Tupac to go on. A sample heavy, mellow groove ignites. What does the bullet mean to the spirit of Tupac? Ma, you already know how I rock. It's bullet speed that we feel deep regret when we perpetrate hate for no good and the nameless bullet lies the death of the hood. Now step off before I put some blood in your mouth. All eyes on these. The spirit of Tupac steps to the sleeper. Saucy hustles the sleeper away. Tupac looks on. Before the hood dies, the love vibration must rise. But how do we do that? Hmm? I I need to know. If I'm to make it so, there's so many things that I just don't know. You must heal emotionally, socially, and psychologically via spiritually. All bullshit aside, I must be what you need or I wouldn't be. Besides now, I'm your spiritual waiter. If true enlightenment becomes your flavor, you can overcome any hater. I suppose that's a possibility, but what about the dichotomy? Who will explain that to me? The spirit of Josephine Baker steps up. That would be me. Josephine Baker, here to tell you about the dichotomy. It's two separate but equal forces opposing with ferocity. It's headlining at the Cotton Club while the Jim Crow roost hangs over me. It's the mind and the body without the spirit to lead. The sleeper flirts with the spirit of Josephine, who returns the energy, so the sleeper moves in much too close. Now that's the truth, Rue. The spirit of Josephine Baker has a gun to his stomach. To think me so easy, a fool's insistence. As a spy, I smuggle messages in my lyrics for the French resistance. To master the dichotomy, you must release resistance. Yeah, just watch yourself. Stepping to JoJo could be bad for your health. The sleeper pulls out his gun. The lights go out and the sleeper is under a spotlight, completely by himself. The sleeper scowls. All lights up. We're in a garden. The spirit of Johnny Cochran steps from the shadows, accompanied by a bass heavy beat. Johnny walks him under a gigantic white oak tree, AK-47, covered in a natural orange peel. A snub nose, 36 with grape, leaves spouting from its handle. Definitely strange fruit. Salty returns. The spirit of Johnny Cochran, perhaps you can tell me, what is the Black Bullet dichotomy? The black bullet dichotomy to me, it's the way that the white man has convinced himself that the bullet means something different for the brother than anybody else in the world community. Could that be right? Close, but not quite. 
Kramer is fed up with the double talk and the runaround. How am I supposed to understand all of this spiritual gobbledygook, man? Would you just stop sticking your head in the sand? This is not how the real world works. Damn. Staying in the sweet spot requires rumination. Gratitude, meditation, or appreciation. But thinking deeply, yes, it requires great concentration. It stands to reason that this dichotomy, it promotes the separation. Where we feel we are not connected and all divinity goes undetected. Spiritual gold, not prospected. Which makes me believe I may never reach my destination. <sighs> Scene four, salty frets, lights rays of stage right. An enslaved woman, a 20 year old black woman in a slave hoop dress with bright yellow head rag. She's not happy with the sleeper's rhetoric. Enslaved woman is joined by the overseer, a white 20 something racist male dressed in overalls with a wide brimmed hat, totting a shotgun. A harmonica and a blues guitar reminiscent of B.B. King's Lucille transition leads into a guitar and a harmonica accompanied blues poem. It's just not fair to have all of these generational curses to bear. Guilt over my son and Pashu's girl is just the tip of the wrongs that I've done. The legacy of slavery is why I can't get my life together. It's this the tyrannical emotional tether. All that pain down on my head, I'd be better off dead. Enslaved woman snatches a switch, then advances on the sleeper. How's any Black man supposed to make it when he has such traumatic beginnings? The bullet has led to so many sad endings. If the slave had just stood up to their tyranny, who knows where I'd be? Enslaved woman's the name I go by. And how you talking about your big mama's big mama's big mama ain't nothing but a bald face lie. It's a Sambo shuffle shame. You need to put some respect on that thing. And bad talk about Massa show gonna get you lashed. Talking all that trash. Massa feed us and love us and he, he the best Massa I know. And I'll whip anybody who say it ain't so. Stupid ass youngin, don't even know. You fighting with me about the man? Dang. Through so much heartache forced to bend, don't know where the master's hand in and my body begins. And them big words ain't gonna do nothing but get you hurt. You need to get in line or you'll end up with more than just misery on your mind. I am the grand overseer. I rule through cruel and sadistic fear. See, first, you visit all manner of sexual perversion on them. Then convince them that their ancient philosophy is heresy. Then teach them that their rewards to be totally holy. All other reward comes after they die. That's how you keep them busy. Enslaved man dressed in a high water pants and put on put upon suspenders with a frayed sweater cap shows up beside the overseer. Enslaved man. The slave man looks up like, yes, sir, boss. I lie. The slave man nods, no, sir, boss. Now take this fine young thing, this daughter of Ham. Inside, completely frightened, and she's a good girl, her European ancestry evident in her new native tongue, also in the way she mercilessly beats her young. Look. Once you were freed from slavery, they left you no choice but to stand upright in society. You should have immediately gone into a state of amnesty. Johnny if there had been a lawyer like me, stage. if there had been a lawyer like me there to make the case for the race, we would have been rewarded for America's disgrace. And that's exactly what the black man now needs. Give yourself free amnesty. I give it to you and you give it to me. For every black man and woman from sea to shine and see. For all the lashes and longings created by slavery. Amnesty. I would have negotiated more than 40 acres and a mule. Mules can't even reproduce. Johnny hugs him like a brother. But being forced into hard labor, traded immorally, 
More attention must be paid. Education as recompense for all of this white ignorance. And this should be annual money dispersed. Let America pay for its curse. I'm just saying, America has a bill that's overdue. The overseer cordals the stain. Here's the invoice. Where is my change? Real change, like reparations. See, in the earlier drafts of the Emancipation Proclamation, it spoke to the colonization and compensation. We now revisit this conversation as a nation. The overseer stares straight ahead, unmoved. The spotlight on the spirit of Johnny Cochran fades, and he watches as enslaved woman antagonizes the sleeper. Now check your neck. Where's my respect? Look, from the top of the deck, you get no respect. I ended up with the ancestors from hell. These are the cards that I've been dealt. And what you looking at? I didn't get here on my own. It's your emasculated marrow set in my lambaster bones. The sleeper pulls a gun on them. And you're going to help me atone. You kill us, then how are you going to learn what you're supposed to know, Dumbo? You the one going to suffer if we death come by here, Jim bro. You just said and see if what I say ain't so. The spirit of Johnny Cochran takes him downstage right to a water well. It seats beneath a great oak tree. Johnny primes the large metal, slightly rusted pipe. Enslaved woman, overseer, and enslaved man look on. Slavery ended just 74 years before I came to be. See, the white man had our whole world in his hand including the gigantic testicles of the enslaved African. Johnny grabs a small, slightly dented tin cup. He begins to fill the cup as he speaks. His concept of manhood was developed under duress, completely without his input until long after the decision-making could be finessed. See, every shred of the black male pride is to be preserved, but that by no means suggests it's the way that his manhood should be measured. More credits deserved. Johnny Cochran takes a sip from the cup, then offers it to the poor parched sleeper. He enjoys the cool hydration. At least we wasn't shooting and killing each other. Shut up, motherfucker! Enslaved man becomes enraged. He jumps in the sleeper's face. Ah, ain't do that! The beloved shopkeeper, a volatile yet enlightened mentor, has come to set the sleeper's feet on the final leg of his spiritual journey. The beloved shopkeeper has his head down so as not to be noticed. You nasty mother! The beloved shopkeeper smacks the fuck out of the sleeper. The beloved sleeper raises his head and takes off his hat. Scene six. But sure, just as sure as I am the sleeper, I just got the foolishly underrated cultural knowledge smacked out of me by the beloved shopkeeper. But let's see what you do up against this heat. The sleeper puts the gun to the beloved shopkeeper's head. You gonna do yourself like this again? The game's about over. You can still rock this joint. It's down to a field goal. Let me help you get the point. You can still grab the win. Come on, coach, put me in. The sleeper lets his gun hand fall to his side. By living authentically, it's a piece of cake to align and find true peace. Just a piece of peace would be enough for me. Damn, you're starting to sound like Uncle Sam. Air Force, Nellis Air Force Base, Las Vegas, Nevada, a sculpto. I get that, aim high. I'm a lean green marine. Hoorah, simplify. The beloved shopkeeper know, but... squats. The sleeper squats. The beloved shopkeeper begins to hand bone as he sings a military cadence song. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Confession is good for your soul. Proving I was worthy of my newly acquired civil rights. I exercise my right to fight. Tucson, the northwest of South Vietnam. I'm on the cow. And this hazy, bow-legged brother to the Fontaine is on the 79, armed to the teeth. The beloved shopkeeper revisits the heavy gun he once manned. And if only his mind, he swings the imaginary artillery device like he's in a virgin Vietnamese foliage. Picking them off left and right. I had 23 notches on my belt. 
That night, I fell right in sleep. I woke up to the sound of a 51 cal enemy fire. The enemy had killed this son of a grand wizard clansman, Goma Pyle looking cracker. Then the enemy looked me right in my eyes and said, G.I., go home. You have a war to fight at home to be considered a whole man. And he let me and stunned as to the blue live. That was the first time I could see this dichotomy. You see, son, there's this thing called plantation politics. That's when you consider what the white man thinks before you consult even your own soul. But that's what the nectar of alignment so sweet. What is above the ego's head is below your spirit's feet. I refuse to kill another man for the man that refused to see me and my man as men. I was almost 4F. They stuck me in a mortuary affairs instead. I became the keeper of the dead, my brother's keeper. Just too many tutaboos. Where's the gun? Where's the fucking gun? The sleeper hand bones as he speaks. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Confession is good for the soul. My father was the light of my life, but I found out he sold drugs, which meant he could lose his life. I didn't want to be another black fatherless son, so I sealed his fate. I hid his gun. A gunshot brings out blam. I hope you're happy. Your father's dead. I still hear the thunder of the bullet. He was just gone too soon. Hear me now. This is what you must do. You must find a way to soothe the guilt and shame this generates in you. Forgive yourself. Guilt. Gone. Shame. Gone. Addicted to the emotional pain. Oh, gone. The song repeats. Guilt. Gone. Shame. Gone. Addicted to the emotional pain. Oh, gone. The sleeper feels the love, then. Gone, 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 gone. I want my son to feel this free. Exactly. Now your son is 11 years old and you've been homeless since you was two. But he's the reason I'm homeless too. Paid child support for years while living on these streets. So who you think you're talking to? You! Brother, you're just too rude. Disrespecting the ancestors is crazy. You've got to finesse the answers you need. You've got to be persuasive. Your son's grandparents are taking care of him financially. The beloved shopkeeper seems to look through him. How are you supposed to expose the black bullet dichotomy unless you heed me? And then you'll see how this contrasting experience can be just the thing you need. Why did you kill me? I don't have to take that from you. True. So you don't know, do you? I'm not sure. I thought it was a ring light, a compressor mic, and a YouTube channel production team type. Now I just want to atone to make it right. Well, you can rest assured that my motives are pure. Take it from a timely man that you made late. You've not changed your fate. Beyond your beliefs, you cannot create. Your mental system needs an update. Did you know that in your body there are pockets of self-hate? The beloved shopkeeper literally takes the sleeper under his wing. Dick, let's delve into this dilemma a little deeper. Take it from me, the beloved shopkeeper. Do this and worry for nothing else. Become authentic love for your whole self. I don't believe in a jealous God of wrath. So just save your breath. I never thought about it that way. M maybe I am okay. This thinking helps you to succeed. Like the feelings of guilt that used to plague my soul had me spinning out of control. I released the guilt. Now I'm free. And that's what staying the course taught me. If I can just get you to lay down that piece. And so that 
you can truly find peace. Lord, have mercy on me. General curses that uh, continue on through my seed. That's the dichotomy. That's the dichotomy, don't you see? I hope you're beginning to understand, son. This is about the I am. Word? I, I never thought about it that way. Now, what you say? This dichotomy fosters toxic masculinity. Let me tell you about this couple named Ezel and Florence. I used to know, but around the way they used, they were just easy and flow. Easy was a stone cold ladies man, but Flo was his main girl. She wanted to be everything to him, but he had many women in this world. But then she aligned herself with love and sent out the love vibe. And he came and laid at her feet and tossed all those other girls aside. <laughs> See what you did there. You eased your meaning in the side door. In order for me to have what I want, I must align. That's the meaning of that metaphor. The next time I get pissed inside, I, I know there's a peace I can find. Find the worth within yourself. Lack of self-love is truly a trap. In other words, mind the gap. The gap? Now, what's that? It's like the DJ who chases the groove. Why would you chase the groove? Because just like the source, it won't come to you. You've got to catch the groove. It's the same way with your spiritual vibe. It's going to stay high flying. So you're the one that's got to, got to jive. And the gap is between you and the groove. Like the distance between the turntables and the headphones. And how you, and how good you feel. How the gap's known. Oh, I, I, I get it. The closer I am to my spirit, the more I feel like my soul. And that's the gap I'm trying to control. I, I, I can feel a, a revival in my soul. The way you were mistreated left you feeling rejected. And your neediness comes across as cruelty, leading others to feel disrespected. I was just so confused. But what you say rings true. The atonement can absolve you totally. It can do it for you. It did it for me. Every painful memory from your past is there to lead you to, the, to your past. Things are always working out for you. Isn't that contrast? Scene seven. The sleeper and the beloved shopkeeper look to the slave man, slave woman, and the overseer. They are under a stark spotlight. Overhead, a furious juke joint banjo and an ambitious jug and washboard get the party started. The overseer and the slave woman drop it like it's hot. The lights go blue. The overseer smacks the slave woman on the buttocks and slave woman pretends to enjoy it. The overseer smacks the slave man on the ass and slave man's infuriated, pulls down his sweater cap to reveal a mask to the overseer's dismay. Music transitions into Curtis Mayfield's Freddy's Dead. The light strobes that accent the music are red, white, and blue. Meanwhile, enslaved woman has relieved him as a, relieved him of his shotgun. Enslaved woman hands it to the enslaved man. Enslaved woman shimmies off her hoop skirt, and she has on a mini skirt underneath with a revolver and the garter. Enslaved woman shows the gun in his face. What you got on my forty acres and my mule, fool? And slave woman pulls his belt from his trousers to reveal his tidy whities, which transform him into a modern day pervert. You can have my money. I don't want any problems. Wise cracker. And slave man points the shotgun at his junk. You thought you could suck all the flavor out of this here jawbreaker? You just a whip whip cracker. Jesus Christ. Slavery ended over 150 years ago. When are you black people going to get it together? Contrast. That's where you encounter something that you don't want, which lets you know what you do want. The second bounce. The moment you know that you want what you want, your spirit takes its form. Immediately. It's the difference between reacting and creating. It's the same letters, but it's just a different spelling. Perhaps it's time for a little more truth telling. I just wanted to make love to my girl, but she had a hard day with the baby. 
And when she does, that sexy little pout with her eyes, it drives me crazy. Now, true, she was barking on me, but the way I responded was up to me. I could react, throw the love off track. No, fuck that. Have a negative reaction? No, I choose satisfaction. I choose to raise my vibration, thinking thoughts of love about my girl like my spirit does. I chose to create. I a babysitter and booked an elaborate and expensive date. Once you get on your spirit's vibe, you thrive. All thoughts reflect the spiritual climb and everything you want will see through love's eyes. Word, life, we made love like you wouldn't believe that night. Well, if I decide to listen to you, what is it exactly you're telling me to do? Just get into the zone and stay there as long as you can, as much as you can. Well, how will I know when I'm there? You get goosebumps and you feel resonance with your soul. You'll know when you're there, trust me, you'll know. I just didn't understand. Say, let me understand, I pray. How do you think I know what I know? Living in the hood forced me to grow. That's how this dichotomy affected me. How do you think everyone in the hood knew I had PTSD? Contrast fuels lyrical. I chose to pass so that we'd meet in the physical. Now we must expand through the metaphysical. Now you can let all loved ones know. We're ancient beings of non-physical light who take on these fleshly robes with a fancy flight. And when we expand, our fires ignite. You're the man I shot and killed, albeit accidentally. You must be here to set me free. I am indeed. Then you forgive me? No need for penance. Your only function is to bring about the worldwide atonement, the at one meant, a love elevation across creation, gathering all the cooperative components. It's when you love your whole self unconditionally, you get on the right frequency that the spiritual plane opens up, baby. You mean the spiritual plane's available to me? <laughs> it's like you have ESP and you can feel the love exponentially, but it starts with self-empathy for yourself, then you'll see. Now I'm going to align, so just watch me. We hear a radio tuner and the beloved shopkeeper tilt his head. We hear the signature 70s retro groove reminiscent of the brand new heavies. It just can't be that easy. You ask me, you talking to me greasy. Bro, your ego, the feelings of wrongness that stun, stunted your growth. You're moving towards freedom. The ego will fight for its sadness and die for its madness. Why did he give you the gun? Could have been someone's vendetta against you, son. I was blinded by intentions I thought to be good. I just want to get my seed out of the hood. The sleeper pulls out his iPhone. <laughs> he just went viral the other day. Views so far? One million and seven. They call him uh, MC Man Man. Uh, he's only 11, but he's on his way. And I, I needed that money to capitalize on his momentum or build his cachet. Now what you say? Wanted him to have a ring light and a compressor mic. Uh, his uncle Cashew and his aunt brought their son, who's the same age as mine. Everything he needs to succeed. Cashew's son, uh, Amaretto, went viral as well. He had two million views because his video was polished. It was produced so well. Well, how did your son go viral in the first place? <laughs> uh, it was the way he made his case. The poem about how his father, uh, me, was that I'm a poet, and he's the M MC. Uh, let me see. The sleeper tries to get a signal. The beloved shopkeeper gives him a look like, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Not likely to get a signal in here. But uh, he went viral because he was speaking of his love for me. He was in the zone. Now I see. Just teach him what you're teaching me. 
So all I need to do to reach him is expose the black bullet dichotomy. <laughs> Let no other loved one go out this way. Help me understand, I pray. That's what I said. And be careful what you pray for because it's what you always get. I must make my witness. For no man knows when shall come the end time of his days. Before this day is over, you will die. You must get word to your son. The sleeper missed, resigns himself to his fate, a new resolve. I want my son to be good when I'm gone. I must atone. What was done must be undone. That can't happen at any time unless you align. I hear Source clearly telling me his connection will soothe his anxiety. He'll come to release his angst, anger, and however righteous deep-seated animosity. And by virtue of his ADHD, if I just let him be. Let him be. No more trying to make him fit in. He'll find strength within. Let him be. Seeing myself authentically makes it easy for me to let him be. That's what my mother did for me. On this high vibration now I can see in the best way she knew how, she loved me. It was plantation politics that got me beat. A 70s retro guru by the brand new heavies. The sleeper finds alignment, pink and purple light strobe. Sati rushes out to embrace him as the lights rays up stage left. The ancestors appear and the sweet spots back once again. Scene eight. All I had to do was love my son unconditionally and I could see him in his authenticity. I could Sati see receives a revelation. If I could teach all little black boys to be who they be, they'll be in alignment and then we're home free. Oh my Lord, what a glorious day. When you're in alignment, you're out of harm's way. <laughs> now it's a party atmosphere. <laughs> it's like, I've got to maintain a frequency like the 808 keeps the beat, like the vibrational pitch is preserved by meditation, which is in essence spiritual auto-tune. Yo, that's true. Yeah, that's how I rock. I can teach the law of attraction used in the church of hip hop. Oh, that's wild. So how would you explain the doing of your mind? Well, uh, it's a sort of basic understanding of master and freestyle. New neural networks bridging beliefs through thought pathways that work. Man, this is so wild. This makes sense. Whatever gets this victory won. And if I explain it, this way, it'll make sense to my son. But now, how would you explain the atonement? Oh, it, it's all about alignment. It's the connection that keeps you impacting. It's about creating, switching up on the reactive. If you can focus your thoughts into alignment, then you can have, be, or do anything, any dilemma you can solve them. Because my potential's bigger than my problem. Because just like a hip hop hit can make you see stars, I can use this cold lyrical currency to get me into these hot bars. And to find satisfaction, Star. All you have to do is move in the direction of who you really are. <laughs> the holiness of spiritual law through the church of verse. It's only fitting that it be spitting. Life is over too quick, man. We in it now. I haven't paid child support in a while, but I've got to get this word to my son somehow. Just see your child's mother through the eyes of source. Of course. My internal dialogue is changing from low to high self-esteem. My whole thought process is elevating to a higher vibration and my energy is really beginning to beam. Good. That's why your success has been so fleeting. Your inner dialogue up to now has been self-defeating. So. As a man thinketh, so is he. The dichotomy has altered original man's frequency. It's time to get back to the ancient age of philosophy. I feel close to bringing the world to a tone. Folks in the know call it the at one minute. Yeah, now at least I can finally see that. It's a setup, so I forgive myself. 
people who support these plantation politics, they're helping to create these cold blooded killers. There's an undue social pressure for kids who have these socially and emotionally challenging childhoods. If a little black boy has been through so much trauma that he's not capable of performing on the same playing field, give him a field that he can play on since his ancestors built the fucking stadium. That's right. Now that you've given yourself the gift of awareness and forgiveness, that's the last step. Now, I just want to be a help. But when I think about the misuse of guns in our community, well, the gun sellers' pockets just get fatter. Make your understanding of guns matter. Respect, Ms. Nina. It's not the heater that's the problem, son. It's our dysfunctional relationship with the bullet that must be undone. All hail the heater. The sleeper puts the safety on the gun. All of the ancestors put their hands in the air where the sleeper holds up his gun. The ancestors put their hands down and sit at the sleeper's feet. Because we do need to have guns to protect our family authentically. And especially being it's open season on us, OG. And I guess I did have to reconcile myself through spirituality. Now to the questions that in your heart burn. Tell me, what have you unlearned? I've learned that, unfortunately, some Black folks feel one thing and say another. And that if your mom's is abusive, it's okay not to listen to your mother. I've learned to love my whole self, no matter my lack of position or deposit of my wealth. <laughs> I've learned that any ailment I have is by virtue of someone I haven't forgiven, and that only basking in my source's elevated vibration will maintain this awesome feeling I'm feeling. And the vibration I have determines the life I'm living. Congratulations for finding your awareness to the true path to social relevance. You finally gain emotional intelligence. I take courage in learning from you in this way. I believe I'm ready to have my say. I understand how this was the underhand of capitalistic bullshit all along, leaving my ancestor's song unsung. No more generations need buckle under the weight of the masses gun. It was a lack of love that led me to that gun, kept me on the run. A tear, a, a rage, getting more violent at every stage until I finally took a light. And misery as midwife. That's what came from making peace by way of my peace. Shutting down my man ways when I was two just so I could be accepted by you, denying my authenticity. Now I make peace with my peace. And I can clearly see how to make peaceful, provocative and impervious poetry finding that God is pulling for me just as I be following spirits lead. Yes, finally made peace with my peace. You have come to remember what you came to forget. Processing your anger in a healthy way means no more regret. I'm worthy to spread the news of the at one man. Knowing the reason for which it was meant, my vortex has gathered every cooperative component, every necessary moment spent. It's time to say a prayer. Without further ado, I put one in the air. The sleeper kneels, clasps his hands together to pray. I open myself to the final phase. I'm prepared to enlighten the race. I pray to reach each and every loved one, and especially those who harness the sun. I bow to soar through, soar straight to the spot, knowing that one who's connected to the sources more powerful than a million who are not. Scene nine, the slave catcher bursts through the mock oak door, then shoots in the air. <laughs> Sleeper. You coming with me. It's time you did the time for your crime because I'm going to end your ass permanently. 
And let's see these puny ancestors and their martyrs of this head dichotomy try and stop me. The ancestors step in between the slave catcher and the sleeper. The spirit of Tupac jumps in front of the spirit of Josephine. He leans over like he's laying on the cross. Atonement undoes all errors. The sleeper grabs his gun and begins to reload. All of the spotlights on the ancestors die. They freeze. The dark sage is lit only by spotlight. It lights up the beloved shopkeeper, the slave catcher, and the sleeper. All stand frozen. If you take up the last leg of this journey, you will be afforded an armor bearer. The sleeper lets the gun fall to his side. The spotlights come up on the ancestors again. They animate. Ah, oh, come on, mister. That's just the way it is. Please spare us. You know the sleeper brought this on himself and he can't blame no one else. The slave catcher points and shoots, boom. The spirit of Tupac falls over dead. The spirit of Josephine leans over like she's on the cross. You ain't no better. And the sleeper is the worst one of all. And to try to tell me it's the white man's fault, that's just gall. The slave catcher takes aim at the spirit of Josephine. Boom! The slave catcher shoots the spirit of Josephine. She collapses. The spirit of Harriet does the cross-laying motion. The spirit of Johnny Cochran runs to her side. She pushes him back to his place. She gets in the slave catcher's face. He's visibly shaken. Sleeper, I pray you do not fall. God's personal salvation leads to revelation. I'm sure God knows my heart. He sees my divine motivation. Unless I'm still being used by the man and yet in need of divine revelation. The spirit of Harriet looks at the slave catcher with disdain. The slave catcher takes aim. Boom! The spirit of Harriet falls over dead. The slave catcher slows as he hears them giving the word of truth. The slave catcher approaches, saucy, hesitant. The soul of man's in a state of grace forever. In man's his soul, therefore man's in a state of grace forever. My soul belongs to the man, and it seems I'm doing his bidding yet again. I want to do what's right. Please try and understand. Tati does the cross-laying motion. The sleeper runs towards her, but the beloved shopkeeper pushes him back to his previous place. Long hesitation. Boom! Tati crumbles in a heap. The sleeper howls in agony. The lights go dark and the beloved, the lone spotlight watches him as he finishes loading his gun. The sleeper takes aim. Ability is the potential. The sleeper, tortured, lets his gun fall to his side. The lights come up. My sins are unintentional. Please, there is no bargain I can plead. My transformation is essential. The slave catcher wails. The spirit of Johnny Cochran approaches him. He does the cross-laying motion. Ah! Boom! The slave catcher shoots the spirit of Johnny Cochran as he falls over dead. Achievement is the expression. Why can't I ever be a blessing? If I am honest with you, do you think the Lord will hear my confession? The beloved shopkeeper shrugs his head at the slave catcher's deep question. The beloved shopkeeper does the cross-laying motion. Boom! The sleeper holds a gun pointed directly at the slave catcher. We hear the radio tuner play the brand new heavies, 70s retro groove. The sleeper begins to have a spiritual fit. He stops the spasms. The sleeper kneels, then offers up the gun. Atonement is the purpose. And this atonement feels so sweet. And if it feels like it's just for me, in your hands, my fate I give, it's up to you, brother. Do I die or do I live? For you, my life I'd freely give. The slave catcher falls to his knees, transformed. The sleeper and the slave catcher are knee to knee.
to the sacrifice, I have been changed. Now I sense I can heal, stop this hair pain. Just as easy as I reach for that gun, the white man is where I landed, son. The spiritual plane has opened up to me completely. Now, I plead thee, heed my prophecy. You are a prophet destined, no one can deny. There will be a plot aiming to take your life. If you hold true to your fate and your newfound truth, there'll be nothing impossible unto you. But brother, be careful though. Oh, now that I have atoned to expose the dichotomy, how do I receive word to make it so? When you bring this wall into atonement, you'll expose the black bullet dichotomy. I have received word, and now I want to raise up my ancestors and dispel all the lies. Scene 11. Won't you help me call the ancestors to rise? Oh, ancestors, rise. Take your rightful place in my life. Sing it with me. Oh, ancestors, rise. Oh, ancestors, rise. Take your rightful place in my life. Take your rightful place in my life. The sleeper audience repeats that as the ancestors rise. When they've all risen suddenly, the sleeper wheezing for air collapses. Stage dark. We hear a breathing machine turning, machine turning out of air in out, in, out, in, lights out. Scene 12, downstage left lights raise. The stale scent of death hovers. Dr. Dump and Nurse Altwright stand over the sleeper dismantling the last of the imaginary breathing apparatus. The sleeper's heart monitor flatlines. The beep continues throughout. Nurse Altwright raises the sheet as the sleeper gives up the ghost. The sleeper has perished. His quest is done. He was trying to win a war that could never be won. I declare him dead at 10.03. And the sleeper will not expose the black bullet dichotomy. Nurse Otwright drops the sheet and pushes the gurney to the front of the stage. The beep slowly fades. Whatever, white girl. We just gonna have to see. End of Act Two. The beep winds into an ungospel chord on a Hammond played by a gift gospel organist. Act three, scene one. At rise, blank stage save a stark white spotlight on the poetess. Once again, nine months pregnant and prepared to burst. The at one means in the air. I've regained the light of one who is about to bring new life. And true alignment means I no longer worry for this young king's life. For when he's in alignment, he's out of arm's way. Oh, great day, and as we live authentically, we'll finally expose the Black Bullet dichotomy. Lights up. New Orleans-style band accompanies the procession with a solemn version of Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. It's sung by five pallbearers, all dressed in yellow choir robes. The ticket taker, the poetess, Dr. Dump, Nurse Altright, and security. They are the choir. They put a cardboard box over the rolling table and push him downstage. The music starts out slow. Swing low, sweet chariot, come and go to carry me low. Swing low, sweet chariot, come and go to carry me low. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Come and go to carry me home. The New Orleans style band music picks up the pace for eight counts and then a hip hop beat takes over. It was woke as sleeper from Utopia, Mississippi. Looking like a thug, but speaking like a hippie. His word was official. His delivery though was trippy. The curtain opens. There's a lectern and a stained glass lighting. They're in a sanctuary in the funeral home. The organ falls into a loop. The poetess approaches the lectern, then grabs the mic. Behind her, the choir form, singing background. Next to them sits Cashew. Mm -hmm. 
here at J. Foster Phillips on the southeast side, Queens. You kill him and we chill him, if you know what I mean. Here lies the sleeper who couldn't pay his way and his welcome he overstayed. The poetess wipes the sweat from her eyebrow. He came to die by the bullet that he lived by. I hate to say it, but no, I don't. I need to chill out, but no, I won't. He needed to be set free. Officially, he was a killer, and so I sing his obituary. He didn't even keep his promise to me. He was supposed to expose. The sound of a mighty rushing wind billows, and then a stream of white light accompanied by angelic music streams in from the left side of the ceiling. Scene two, the sleeper rises, a turban, on with a t-shirt that reads the mad prophet. He rises peacefully. Expose the black bullet dichotomy. I am the mad prophet. P-R-O-F-I-T. That's what I came to give. Mad prophet. To the world and to my seed. He has risen. He has risen from the dead with the bullet hole straight through his head. <laughs> he has been tried by fire. Let all behold the coming of a Messiah. The choir all fall to their knees except for Cashew, who remains seated with his mouth agape. The followers all lift their heads as we hear a cacophony of radio tuners. The beat of brand new heavy 70s retro groove, which heralds all of the followers' transformations. Then it ends. He has risen. Death is pulling, pulling not hold him. We have all been transformed, all been changed. The brand new followers with brand new names. You were the ticket taker way back when pain was the metal and I was the wearer. Now I'm sister woman follower, the mad prophet's honor bearer, armor bearer. The ticket taker becomes sister woman follower and evolves compassionate girl that raises her vibration. It's time to show the world, my heart. And I've got your back because I'm Brother Can Do, the Mad Prophet's bodyguard. Dr. Dump becomes Brother Can Do, an evolved protector who safeguards the words of the Mad Prophet. The warrior gives the Mad Prophet an intricate pound, a complex handshake. You tried to kill me and then front. No! Now I'm Mother Love, the Mad Prophet's confidant. Nurse Altright becomes Mother Love, the Mad Prophet's heart protector. As security, I was the man who sweated you hard, but now I'm Deacon Brother Follower, the Mad Prophet's heart. Deacon Brother Follower and the Mad Prophet do an even more complex hood death. They take off their choir robes. They wear all white underneath. The Mad Prophet takes the poet's hand. I'm sure I want to help you with your son as sure as I feel that I'm the one to advocate among the brethren for a healthy relationship with the God. The poetess embraces him, then kisses him on the cheek. Ashu, what do you say? We're all aware of your deeds on this day. Now, if we are to expose the black bullet dichotomy, which we will do, we must start the worldwide at one minute with you. I was just here to make sure the coward was dead, sincere hater. That's for turning up with my girl to wander. For our friendship, there is no remainder. She passed away alone at exactly midnight. She dies so sweetly each night, which makes her passing all the more necessary. This man's supposed to be dead, and yet he sings like a canary. I put everyone here on notice, so get it right. She is yesterday, and yesterday died last night. Yesterday died last night. How can you stand here like you're on some quest? You need to show the beloved shopkeeper 
some respect. No more blood need be spilled. I have forgiven myself and released all guilt. I'm sorry for sleeping with your girl. That was wrong. It was a cry for healing all along. Well, sorry ain't do it. And you know what? Fuck this shit. Cashew lunges at him. Feel no guilt over what has occurred. I realize anger and ego have your focus blurred. That's it, son. You're the one who did it, and that's my word. Cashew takes out a gun. Cashew points it at the ground and clocks it, but he accidentally shoots it. Cashew shoots himself in the foot. Ah! I feel a corset through my veins, poisoning my brain. It's lead poisoning. It's your fault thing. It turned out this way, and I know some folks who gonna feel away. Let's see what the saboteur has to say. Believe me, you, today is your day. Cashew curses as he limps off stage. Is this my fucking pinky corn for some fucking poetry porn? Scene three. If he goes to see the saboteur, it may not be wise. The last man who went to see him lost his life. But who's this saboteur and what the hell? He's always easing God out. You know him all too well. I must share my mind. It's time for some black on black rhyme. When black kill black, it's the suicidal solvent, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. We're killing ourselves. The mental and emotional issues of the abuser are often found in the appetite of the oppressed, which you expect. Recompense. In a capitalistic society based on ancestor sweat equity, it's the only thing that makes sense. It's a smart economy that financially empowers a consumer-driven race that falls in line with most to all the propaganda. It's just good business. Not my ancestor native tongue, but it's the main one I use, you know. Is there another race like that, you know? We have been convinced that we are property by everyone that requires financial, social, and emotional support to be undone. And to undo is to atone. The at one minute is coming. And for all the black vets who paid the ultimate price, all in an effort to be truly free, for uh, all the Keyshawns, uh, Talinas, the Janishas, Deontres, and Tutaboos, a moment's meditation on their sacrifice, uh, a moment's silence, please. This modicum of well deserved reverence is for you. I want to call my son to me. Poetess approaches with the latest iPhone. Now I've got to deal with this tomfoolery. No, focus on love and just breathe. The way he's about to connect the with his son? The way he's about to connect with his son. When he succeeds, this madness will be undone and the victory will be won. Look, we want the at one mint. We want the Mad Prophet's message to thrive. Let's put him on IG Live. Yo, there's a tech room in the back. Let's go in there and handle that. Scene four. Upstage left, a yellow fluorescent shimmers behind the Mad Prophet as he's seated behind a regal mahogany desk. A video screen electronically displayed displays the center stage. Here's your chance to school their asses. This is the simulcast globally so you can reach the masses. Where poetry meets scripture, shake it cold like a Polaroid of old, turn a negative into a positive picture. Deacon Brother Follower takes out his iPhone and focuses it on the Mad Prophet. Click the Mad Prophet's on the screen. Live from the soundstage of the village of Queens, we bring to you the street apostle of the holistic hood, the sultan of the source, the herald of the new Jerusalem, the man prophet. We hear the phone ring overhead. It's picked up by his son, Week C, MC Man. A handsome, sweet, savvy young man who smiles incessantly. He splits the screen with the mad prophet. What's good, poet? Uh, what's good, poet? 
Suddenly, we see a scuffle. Camera shakes. We focus, split screen. Gwen, a beautiful sister, stands in front of her bed with freshly washed and folded clothes strewn out. You go in and do your homework with your sister. Look, mister, you know not to try and play with the baby mother. Not to interrupt, Gwen, because I, I want you to have your say, but just on the cool, but I no longer address you that way. I know we've not spoken in a while, but just out of respect, I now refer to you as the mother of my child. Gwen's taken back, a pleasant surprise. Whatever's whatever. Like I said, you made this bed. Now this is where you lay your head. You ain't paid no support, so I'm sorry, sport. But you can't talk to him. Don't call here again until you get what you need. That's, there's not gonna be another time. That's the thing. What, what does that even mean? I guess honesty is the best thing. Not to go too deep, but look, I understand I hurt you bad. And at one time I was all you had. What I did with your cousin Tawanda was totally wrong. My heart has been broken about this for far too long. It's time for my heart to sing a new song. It was just my inconsiderate nature all along. But please, may I speak to my son? Man, man, your father wants to talk to you. Son, whatever you did with your father, whatever, whatever you did with your father, my son, good looking, one. What? Hey, Dad. I've cleared it with a place to put the ring light at and... Uh, you killed that. I've got something much better. I'm not going to fulfill your material wish. Son, get out your bait. I'm about to teach you how to fish. It's about getting in touch with your soul. Then you create your own world. Emotional intelligence will give you complete control. Save me that song about how Papa's got a brand new bag. You doing your dance to a deadbeat, Dad? How could you do this to me? Save the soul-saving spiel for your next spiritual retreat. No, son. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you, little one. I'm saying that you can do, have, or be anything that you want. Just listen to me and you'll see. You're right up the street. Come, come see me. Uh, all right. Just do your poem that went viral, and then if you don't feel what I have to say, I'll be on my way. He's the poet. Not just crickets. Crickets with rickets. He's the poet. After the first time, the poetess begins to beatbox. MC Man Man steps on the stage. Mad Prophet and MC Man Man embrace. He's the poet, and I'm the MC. <laughs> He's my Dr. Evil, and I'm his mini-me. Have you thinking you partying with Professor X the way my rhymes move you telekinetically? How shall I express myself? My vibe manifests energetically, poetically. He's the poet, and I'm the MC. See, for him, flow is like where ice blue waters connect through rivulets and streams. But as an MC, I know flow to be what galls my gut until it shoots out from in between my teeth. You gotta choose your eyes if you wanna see with clarity. Well, he's the poet and I'm the MC. And I'd like to share a little piece of poetry, just a bit of a tender part of the heart of me. Now, <laughs> see, right now you're in the zone spiritually. That feeling you feel is where everything gets real. Yeah, that makes sense because I get everything while I'm in here. And dad, this unconditional love is for everyone too, especially the LGBTQ. Yo, son, you wanna hear some real fire? The acronym for LGBTQ could be, let God be their qualifier. Love, son, that's what I'm putting out into the atmosphere. From inside the zone, everything is clear. Yo, <laughs> ain't nothing you can do that would change my love for you. From non-physical, we come, and back to non-physical, we go. Yo, son, if there's one thing I finally know, 
I learned you got to go for what your spirit yearns. The mad prophet sways to the beat. If you ever look around and I'm not there, look for me here. This is a vibrational reality. It's where you and I connect eternally. Once you realize you're a conduit, you can do it. You don't get what you want until you get what you feel. It's an energy changing matter that has mass appeal. The mad prophet and MC man man begin to rock. From inside the sweet spot, I can manifest hip hop, my rhythmic reality. It's where your real sauce is. That's the business. Oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, just some of the chemicals in the sauce. Every emotion creates a chemical. The sauce contains the healing components, the elixir, the solution. The sauce is the solution. Get your sauce up. Treat the preceding flow as my lyrical thesis. All you need to know, bro, power rock for Jesus. Healing's a stone's throw if you rock with supplemental education. Like a tablet, give it to every obvious descendant of a slave with a curriculum for a four-year degree from a reputable college or university that, if you like, you can study while you're still in high school. That way, every sweat equity descendant of black man and woman will begin life with a debt-free degree, something that slave descendants can make of use immediately with little cost to the government. It's damn near free. Now that's some logic I could see. What we need is white power, not white guilt. That's like cheating the sword of truth and blaming the lie to the hilt. It's been many a hip hop verse generated by the invisible scar of a generational curse. And the black man can use hip hop to bring about the atonement? Then maybe they'll stop killing us, dad, and the black man will be restored to his former prominence then. The poetess brings in a ringing phone overhead. The poetess answers it. It's the holistic hood. The nonprofit attached to the beloved child keeper's estate. <laughs> I've got some news and it just can't wait. They just offered you a $250,000 influencer deal to be a brand ambassador for the shopkeeper's charity. Seems you got mass appeal. Mm-hmm. They feel you've learned so much as the sleeper. Your message was clearly inspired by the beloved shopkeeper. The on us is on us. You can't stay the same and expect change. Young black man, that thrill you're looking for is you going from non-alignment to alignment. You haven't made love until you've made love through the eyes of the source. Brand new Heavy's Retro 70 Groove plays. They're atoning in Swoedo? <laughs> They're atoning in Brixton? They're atoning in Watts? They're atoning in Port-au-Prince? We've hit the mother at one minute. <laughs> but dad, what's up with Uncle Cashew? He was the best friend you had, right? I'm afraid not, son. And what came between us on some real-ish, it was that black bullet bullshit. Lights dark. Lights raise, upstage left. Scene five. We're in the Coliseum on Jamaica Ave. Cashew talks to the saboteur, a volatile and deadly young poet. All we see is the back of the saboteur's head. He wears a knit cap and sunglasses. He's telling them they have no guilt, no matter the wrong they've done, that they are as holy as God's only son. This atonement madness will see him undone. Under the law, it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. According to the word, he must be stoned with some hot lead truth. And to be official, it's something only you can do. It's his fault that I put my pinky corn through. Here is the heater. Do you. The saboteur takes the gun from him, then aims it at Cashew. Cashew gulps. The saboteur is eye to eye with Cashew. The gun is to his head. No, it give e do no. It get evil through feet. You gotta be shitting me. Whatever the fuck you said, you're so foul, you already dead. That goes for the mad prophet and that goes for you too. Cow ooey feet. Elix do. 
I'm in a straight ahead jazz as the saboteur shoots Cashew dead, pulls down the mask and turns to the audience. He takes a step forward upstage right, definitely on the hunt. A cacophony of strobe lights kinetically flickers the straight ahead, but intricate jazz ignites, lights out. Scene six. Lights up, the saboteur gets to the mad prophet. You are one slimy Negro to attack me when it's clear you're my ego? Nook it ye eat ooh, nook it ye evil ooh, see. The mad prophet shakes him. <laughs> if you live by the gun, you die by the gun. But especially if you're black. The mad prophet grabs the saboteur in a headlock and drags him upstage in front of the closing curtain. A gunshot rings out and then a light fixture crashes. Stage dark. The mad prophet seems to remember that sound. The second gunshot goes off. We see the mad prophet crumble. Scene seven. Lights raise, curtains open. We're back at the Spoken World Cafe. Right after the mad prophet, the heckler has replaced the baseball cap that reads the heckler. In the beginning, he had actually shot himself in the head. Cashew has been taken into custody by the police officers. The poets and the EMTs send over the dying heckler. Suppose the black bullet dichotomy. Now that I have taken this mystical journey, I have found this to be what the black bullet dichotomy is all about. They used the bullet to bring us here to build this American dream. <laughs> and now they're trying to use the bullet to, to take us out. The heckler gives up the ghost. The poetess water breaks. Oh, my water! The heckler cell phone rings. The ringtone is Dance With My Father Again by Luther Vandross. The poetess answers the phone. Your dad? The emotional issues he had? He discovered what a light he had. And through his spirit, he made his heart glad. Now that I have your number, I'll call you back. Sure, I promised your dad. Two EMTs push the gurney to the poetess and she lays down and begins to breathe faster and faster. She snaps her fingers and everyone else freezes. A low conga sensuates he her final poem. The addresses this audiences. She stops the frantic breathing and poises herself just so. And just like that, with the cosmic snap, our tale has come to an end. And this ending is where we began. But you now have your own tale to tell, my friend. Ooh, and how you tell it is up to you. I do, however, envy you. The good news you get to share, what you have unlearned here. True, a young poet has taken his own life with a gun before his trip to Utopia, Mississippi had ever begun. But in the last seconds of his life, which you have witnessed here, he gained a new perspective as he released his fear. He evolved to enlightenment so that his light wouldn't be wasted. He rejoined his creator's vibration and godhood was tasted. The moment before he died, he set his spirit free and he was able to make moves energetically. But if you live by the gun, black man, how will you die? And who is to decide? It's all in your vibe if you choose to see. And that is how you expose the black bullet dichotomy. She snaps her fingers and begins to breathe faster and faster Ooh. as the curtain falls. Ooh. And... Ooh. Ooh. Thank you so much for joining us today for The Black Bullet Dichotomy, written by David Stamps and directed by Eric Jordan Young. We are now opening up to the moderated critique session. During this time, you can offer the playwright direct feedback on what you just watched and listened. And you can use the raise your hand feature to get on the mic and make comments in the chat or the Q&A section. We appreciate 
constructive feedback. Uh, the playwright will take this information and work on his rewrites. So I now welcome David Stamps, Eric Jordan Young, and the rest of the cast to the stage, and Garland Thompson, who will be moderating. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Uh, let's start off, first of all, a huge round of applause for number one, this cast that just brought this piece to life in such a magnificent fashion. Uh, a huge shout out to their to their fearless leader, director Eric Jordan Young, whose who's clear and solid hand clearly helped guide this reading today to a very to a very successful execution. So thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and, and of course, thank you to our playwright, David Stamps, for putting together this piece, for taking the time to put this piece together to, I mean, we all just felt it. We all just saw the amount of effort that has gone into this piece, the amount of the amount of, for lack of a better word or better term, the amount of love that has gone into this piece. It is clear with every word we saw, everything from the stage narration to all the characters and a very interesting take too, and that's not used a lot these days and how lyrical it was, how much it was all poetry is like a giant poem, right? And it was just, it, it, that told this incredible story. You know, I, uh, the only thing I can think that kind of comes close in my mind right now is, uh, the great poem, uh, the great uh, Indian poem, the, the Mahabharata, which is a long, huge, incredibly, in just incredible poem. And this piece has that same kind of scope. So I want to thank you very much, David. Um, we are going to talk a little bit. Uh, we'll we'll see how long it goes. Usually we go for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, but uh, audience, what we really want here is to hear, have David, have David hear from you and actors, cast and, and director Eric, please feel free to chime in anytime with any thoughts or feelings you have for David. The idea behind this entire endeavor here is to give David an opportunity to get some information, some feedback that he wouldn't that, that that is not so easy to necessarily come by right and just handing out the script and it's great to get individual opinions and things but to get a group uh as distinguished as this together today is what we want to call upon so audience please feel free to raise your hand we can put you on the microphone if you don't want to be heard we can hear you in the, you can put your question or your thoughts in the chat kimberly gunn also want to thank Kimberly Gunn, our reading producer, by the way, uh, who produced today's reading. She is the executive director of Zoom Catchers, which handles the Zoom Catchers team. Uh, Kimberly, uh, Natalie, and Lily, they all handle all of the technical uh, issues and all the technical challenges that we face in doing one of these. So thank you to that. But Kimberly will be, will be manning the chat room and manning the uh, controls. So if anybody wants to jump in and chime in, Please feel free. Now that said, we're gonna we're gonna proceed along this way. Uh, David, our our playwright, has given us three questions. Three questions that he would like to hear from the audience about. So we're gonna start. I'll let you read these. I'll, I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll take them one at a time. Um, there is also a poll that you can fill uh, that you can fill out an electronic poll here in Zoom, so you can also uh, give your feedback that way as well. The three questions that David has for you is this. Did you see yourself in this play reading journey? Was there something that made you fall out of this story? And lastly, do you feel better after watching this play reading? So let's take the first one. Let's let's see what the, where the first one takes. Uh, please feel free, anybody to jump in. Did you see yourself in this play reading journey? Anyone want to get us started? I do see we have several yeses. We do. Okay. We have several yeses. Okay. So that's, that's good. That's some good feedback. I know I did myself as, as I was thinking about that question. So, but um, is there anybody that has anything a little bit more, let, let's get into a little more detail. We've got a lot of yeses. So that's good to know. That is good to know. Can we, can we uh, peel back the onion a little bit on that? Kimberly, do we have anybody that wants to join us up here on the stage? Um, I see that so we have, let's see, eight yeses or so. I mean, it doesn't 
specifically say who it is. Um, so if those okay. folks want to go on the mic, please feel free to do that. I do want to read out some information in the Q&A. Uh, Janet Marletto says fantastic performance. So congratulations there. And mm -hmm. if anyone's having a problem with the chat, you can put information into the Q&A as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, I definitely agree. It was absolutely an excellent performance. How about this, uh, Eric? What are your thoughts about that? Well, <clears throat> I think there's uh, there are a lot of um, opportunities for people to see themselves in this uh, poem and in this play. Um, there's so many, especially in the, the the climate of the world today. Um, there are just so many relevant issues in the body of this piece, which is what um, attracted me to it when David um, got in touch with me. I just thought that it was very, very relevant and that there are a lot of people out there who um, can uh, see themselves three-dimensionally in the construct of the piece. So um, so I, I think that a lot of people would have the opportunity to see themselves and feel uh and kind of be able to extract um this energy if it wasn't specifically um you know dead on but but that there is a relationship to the experience that uh either cashew has or any of the uh things that the main characters are going through i think it's pretty um pretty important and and very uh relevant right now in my mm -hmm. opinion was there anything uh, just briefly was there anything in particular that a spot that that really hit hit the nail on the head or resonated resonated with for you that you'd like to point out for david well i think honestly the whole thing just the idea that um that you know bullets are what brought black people into this country and bullets are what can take black people out of this country just that alone the the idea of that and bringing that forward and and making a a poem play out of that is um just very it's so fortified and it uh it deserves attention because um the things that we're going through in the world right now um we're we're really trying to find new ways to discuss difficult things and to be able to discuss uh something like this or issues like this in such a poetic way um i think is uh very valuable for a lot of people and um i think it's quite you know it's it's pretty it's very successful that way because like i said there are just so many issues that are being brought up we're talking about <clears throat> you know uh just guns alone in this country um and then just racism on so many different levels not only just external racism but internal racism as well um and and just the vibrations of spirit um i love how there is a a theme of breath and energy that is sustained throughout the, the piece um <clears throat> and how that can be related to the language in that um, you cannot do this poetry without using your breath, as you can see with all of the actors. They are so, um, the language is so full and so grand that even when we were in the rehearsal process, I was talking about how um, it lends itself to uh, the performance kind of strategies or um, style of what would be classic uh, Shakespeare. Um, just because it, 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 the language is so thick that way. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess I, I have a lot of thoughts on it because there are just so many uh, relevant issues, but, <clears throat> but the, the th things that are very, very resonant to me are the facts that uh, of the, are the, is the origin of where all of this language comes from. And it's basically from uh, from breath and from spirit and from energy. And that is uh, something that was very, very attractive to me when I first read the piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, I must say that, you know, having 
just seeing the performance, I learned a lot of new things as well. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the actors were very uh, committed today and they were able to execute the story um, in this virtual sense that um, in a way that gave us the opportunity to hear it and mm -hmm. to understand what the arc is. And it was nice. I, I got to learn a lot of different things about the, the structure of the play. And I find that the music and the physicality of it is is very, very attractive because it is it is definitely something that has a vibe and um, is outside of what would I would consider to be um, lights up, lights down traditional theater. It mm -hmm. is um, it is unique and special and in its own way. And that's something that uh, should be celebrated. Um, so good for you, David Stamps. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not a typical kitchen table drama, that is for sure, with uh, using the various uh, music, using poetry, using magic realism, using mysticism, bring that in. The, the fact that when he goes, when uh, our, our, our main character goes into their coma, how all this this whole other world exists within that coma. That's a, that's a lovely setup. I'm curious from the actor's point of view, I'd like to open it up. The question for you actors, did you see yourself? You, are, you all were playing various characters very well, by the way. Um, did you see yourselves in any of these characters that you were playing in this journey? Uh, I can take the first one. Uh, Excellent. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Price, or I go by day. A funny story of how I became the poetess slash uh, Sati. David Stamp saw a performance of mine back in um, early 2022. It was for a show called Penny's Kids, and it was mm -hmm. performed in a church in the Bronx. And after our last show, David Stamps came up to me with his car and he said, you are my poetess. You are going, I was like, whoa, I just got on a play. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? But the play I did was also about a 19 kind of young girl who had to put on the weight of her family and basically take care of everyone. No, no more childhood. The poetess, she is a 19 year old who is pregnant but who has that type of, you know, how they sometimes say the female is more mature than the male, but I like the way that David writes the poetess as in, no, she's just another black child having a child as a child. And within it, she is taken with the heckler. And as they're, I like how he writes in the tango and how they're both, doing this sort of dance of trying to figure out their life. The way that I, I don't know how David saw it in me, maybe it was the performance, but I have come to truly want to learn and be the poetess, whether on stage or virtually, no matter how many times, but I um, connect deeply with this character and I see myself as this character. Although I am not with child, I have 19, <laughs> and have been under some very, um, I want to say adult heavy issues that as just a 19 year old, all I've had to talk to was my other friends who would be like the heckler or like Cashew, just other kids out in the streets, not really knowing who to turn to or what to do. But all we have is the knowledge that our ancestors brought. So I think David has done a beautiful job with this play and within the characters he's written out within mm -hmm. them. But that's mm -hmm. what I can say for me and the poetess, at least. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Anyone else like to chime in? Uh, I can also speak to that. I think uh, the uh, ideas of destroying your ego in the play and the, the spiritual aspects of the play are, um, you know, things that... Um, somebody who is I'm, I'm a 34 year old male i'm getting into that uh sort of way of thinking now of how do i elevate myself spiritually how do i elevate myself how do i destroy my ego um how do i operate outside of my ego um and i think the idea that that is some type of key to you know our race to 
you know, the freedom of our race is a very interesting idea. So I, I really uh, related to that particular aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's interesting because there is a whole there is a whole movement within the black community now to deal with mental health, uh, to even look at things like black women taking honest rest is a, actually a revolutionary act. So that definitely, I think, comes through in this piece that that love, that self love, that forgiveness, uh, empathy is is really the pathway towards success. Um, though we've had to deal with a lot of a lot of tragedy along the way. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Diana. That day, that was really that was really, and thank you also uh, to our other actor. Um, uh, the second question is: uh, Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add on this on this question? Did you see yourself in this play at all? And no, okay. Let's let's move on to our second question that David had for us, which was: Was there something that made you fall out of this story? Now that goes out to the audience as well. Now, actors, you of course all had so much. You know, you, your lives were very full when it came to this. When it came to this play, but uh, but yeah, feel free to chime in as well. Were there any parts that you thought, well, maybe it kind of did pull me out a little bit, and maybe if we, you know, if this were beefed up a little bit in some way, you know? I'd like to um, just uh, throw out some comments that I'm seeing uh, from people mm -hmm. while, while we ponder that. Uh, let's see. Edward Fee says, "Bravo to the entire cast and crew." Uh, Tim Bellow Sr., great performance, everyone, and on Zoom, well done. Congratulations, David. Um, an anonymous person. This would make an interesting surrealist film. And Jim Willis, in the beginning, it brought back how and why I never allowed anyone else to put me in a compromising situation. No hot head was ever going to fire a gun that would land me in prison or worse. Another commenter. Um, Let's see, the Mahabharata is a good comparison, huge epic. And another person, I appreciated the aspect of the play that dealt with the destruction of a generational curse. And there is someone that wants to go on the mic, uh, Peg Ansley and Edward Fee. I don't know, ever, Edward, if you still want to go on, but Peg, you're able to go on now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, um, my name is Peg Ainsley, and I watched this from uh, the west coast of Canada. Um, congratulations, David. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. I am so um, moved by this. I Good job. And the actors were just did an ama amazing work tonight. Thank you for that, and um, and congratulations as well, of course, to Eric. Um, yes, I found it very relatable. Um, I think you know I haven't shot anyone, but I uh, <laughs> I have had uh, I have had a journey that required uh, ego busting, and uh, and and uh, the spiritual awakening that comes after that um and uh so it it i just i just felt it was really um um touching and and important and and gone all those like i'd love for lynn manuel um, miranda to get hold of this um <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't you <laughs> and uh see what happens um mm -hmm. i um I love the phrase self-inflicted nonsense. Mm -hmm. I love that. And uh, and the play with words, reacting and creating mm -hmm. and onus and on us. Like, um, yeah, just so many beautiful little touches there, David. Um, uh, you know, I love you. And um, I wish you well with this entire project. Congratulations, everyone. 
That's wonderful, Peg. Thank you so much. That you know, it's funny you mentioned the reacting and creating because that's one of the notes that I had uh, made to myself too. How much that really resonated. How much that I, I that was just delicious. There was lovely, delicious wordplay like that. Yeah. Do you feel, Peg? Let me ask you this. Do you feel like this is number one? Could you feel the love that was in the message, or or that that's where David was driving at? And do you feel like? Uh, in addition to it being relevant in terms of being able to see yourself or see things in it, do you feel like it's a message for today? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's the only message, you know? Gosh, the world needs this so badly right now. So badly. And I, by the way, I'm white and in my 70s. <laughs> just so you know um but, thank you <laughs> yes <laughs> i uh it's the first zoom call i've spoken on where people couldn't see my face so uh -huh. okay. <laughs> i forgot to say that but uh yeah i um i'm sorry i got i distracted myself it happens in your 70s that's all right. You 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 reached elder status, so you deserve all the all the respect and love for that. You know, this is you know I, I I've recently been having conversations with folks about how this is a culture, unfortunately, that does not seem to revere uh, our Western culture does not seem to revere elders in the way that other cultures uh, the other cultures do. When in fact, it, in my belief, it should be the opposite. Elders have lots of wisdom. So you are an elder. So you have wisdom, and we're <laughs> glad that you're sharing it uh, with us, Peg. And and I, I, for the record, I agree with you. I think it is an, a very important message, and I think it is. It kind of does boil down to the only message, the only message out there. That's that's really wonderful. It's great to hear too from Canada, from one of our friends up in Canada. So yes, oh, it was good to be here. Thank you, Peg. Thank you. Kimberly, did we have another, uh, did we have a gentleman that wanted to come on? Yes, Edward, if you're able to go ahead and talk. Thank you. Oh, be a pleasure. Well, well, thanks for having me. David, congratulations. C congratulations to the cast. Superb acting. I, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's for me, um, and I, by the way, you know, I'll just give my street credo. Uh, I am from Woodside, Queens, okay? Western Queens in the house. Mm -hmm. so anyway. All right, Queens, yeah. love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I felt the poetry really worked for me throughout the whole piece. Um, this this particular play, um, it also appealed to me. It, I, I feel it's a universe. There's a universal appeal here, okay? And, um, you know, relating to redemption um atonement you know i think anybody can 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 relate to that and identify with that so and you know separate from and i won't speak to the black experience uh, my mine is um I'm, my parents came from ireland but be that as it may um i certainly identify with the peace and um yeah it's uh it it really hooked me and i i love the acting and um I thought all the actors were were superb, and and one one actor in per, uh, particular, I'll be specific. Police officer number two. I liked the way she was listening to people. She was reacting. Her eyes, you know. I was like, and I found myself gravitating there. So I don't want to <laughs> puff one person up. And um, yeah, I was I was in it. I think I did, and I was probably one of the fifteen percent. And I have to. <clears throat> and it certainly there it it certainly doesn't lack underwriting because I'm a writer, David. So I, I'm gonna go very gentle. Okay. <laughs> Positive affirmation first, right? I felt yes. maybe, maybe, and just just positive critique, you know. Um, I'm just going to say that at times it might have started to repeat some rep repetition. Mm -hmm. repeat. Not a big thing, David. Not a big thing. So maybe I don't know. That could be me. Um, but that was my first take, so I could be mistaken. So, uh, but really great job, David. Um, you hit it out of the ballpark, my friend. So, uh, and looking forward to seeing this. What do you, I don't know if you, well, I, I can I ask a question or is just, just sure. I, I, can, I can give you a little update if you like. Yeah. I was just curious as to what, what your next move is with this or what, what, what you plan, what, what are your plans, David? So the plan is uh, I've been offered a $20,000 grant by Ellen Greeley and the Department mm -hmm. of Veterans Services and the mayor's office. She's the chief of staff. So I'm going to produce uh, um, an immersive experience at post, I think it's 834 over here in, in Rochdale, Queens. And it's okay. a 170 seat event hall 
with a full bar and a, a raised stage. So we're going to do an immersive experience there. That's the Great. next. And then we're going to do the Kennedy Center February 5th through February 9th in Studio J. Yeah, 2024. Beautiful. That is fantastic, David. Thank yes, you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Thanks for coming. And, to me. and just one thing, I, I know David from the producer, can I mention it? The Producers Development Mentorship Program. Sure, that's sure. where that's where we met. So with the with hmm. the great Brian um uh uh Mr. Mr. Ost. So uh and I'll leave it at that. So th- thanks for for the invite. It's it's been a great pleasure. Thank you guys. Great job. Thank you, Edward. Thank you. No, that's listen. Constructive criticism is always is always helpful. But you you took the right tack. Always start off. That's what I believe. Always start off with positive, uh, no matter what the constructive criticism may be. And that's really good criticism because there were there are some points in there. I believe, David, that you can take a look, maybe do some trimming back or just yeah, whatever. You know, every piece can can benefit from go having having gone through it like that on it, you know, at least once or twice. So that's great advice. That's wonderful advice. Kimberly, do we have anybody else uh, that would like to speak with us or any other comments in the chat room? We do have a question from uh, Carla with a K and she asks mm-hmm. how much of the script was inspired by scripture? Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Actually, I had a, I had something I wanted to say. I, that was oh. a question, but I do have something I want to say. Please. Okay. okay. Um, Well, first of all, I just want to say, David, great work. You know, I've known you a long time. You know, I love this piece. There's no dumbing down on this work. You know, he's not not pandering to anybody. But I just wanted to say, yeah, I love the play on words. I love the music choices. You know, I I used to be on the radio and I love your old school music choices, the R&B. It's going to be awesome. And also the hip hop, too. Um, Also... Uh, as a Bible, as a Bible reader, and you know, age. I, I'm 64, so I understand, Peg. You know, we we have to, you know, you know. Now we have to understand what age is about. We it it does gain us wisdom, and as someone who has read the Bible, I really appreciate David all of the b- biblical references that you made, like renewing the mm-hmm. mind, mm-hmm. forgiveness referring to the source or God or higher power or whatever anybody calls that. That was awesome. And the son, the importance of the son and the father image and the relationships. And then of course, unconditional love. And that is the answer. Love is the answer, not the gun. So I definitely love this piece and congratulations. And I hope it goes all the way. Take care. God bless you. Oh, and congratulations on both of those things with the with the New York City um, official and the artist in residency. You deserve it. God bless you. Wonderful. And thank you for allowing me to participate. Absolutely, Carla. We are thrilled to have you. We are so thrilled to have all of our actors here. Um, once again, all very, very talented, talented people. Um, the le- the second question uh, is: There anybody want to just say see if there's any comments on that real quick, and then we can jump into our third question. Then we'll just open it up for uh, any comments as we uh, come into a close. But uh, was there something that made you fall out of this story? And again, constructive criticism is absolutely uh, is absolutely welcome. Uh, as a playwright, David needs to hear from other from other eyes, from other ears. Uh, if something is is working or not, could be massaged, could be moved in another direction. So, is there anyone who'd like to who'd like to join us? And again, I encourage our actors to to uh, jump in with any thoughts you might have because you guys say the words. So, if anybody if anybody would know if something needs some massaging, I'd have to say probably our actors would know. So, feel free. It's funny. This is like being in, in high school again. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody, I can say nobody I can this. say I can say a couple things in that. Like one of the things that I do really appreciate about this piece is that it has this internal rhythm to it and this drive. Um, so, so you know, in in the the realm of of kind of looking forward and trying to realize or, or think about what how the show can be realized and what it can be. The rhythm of the piece is so uh, infectious 
um, that um, when it does repeat, it is uh, it, it it seems to lock in in a in a place uh, that associates itself with the music and uh, the the energy of the community and um, the 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 just dipping into um, trying to get your point across and so so the re when it does uh, recur when there are moments that are repeated um, I think that you know, in, in looking to the future of what this piece can be, I think it, it opens it up to uh, conceptual, you know, movement and different types of, of beats and rhythms and, and things like that. So, um, so the idea of the repeating is actually rhythmical and almost like musical to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's the oh, go for it. Who is who is that coming up next? Yes. Hi. Yes. My name is Dale Genesis, and I get I can second a bit what Eric said in the sense that with myself, I'm a poet as well. So, me personally, sometimes I get and this is not bad criticism at all. I get so caught up in the language sometimes because it's it's so good and it's so raw and it's pure and just the way that it's used to, to break down and describe something so intense or simple, sometimes my mind goes off from the plot because I'm so stuck on to what is being said as far as the language. And to me, that's powerful when you can be drawn into someone's work that way, especially watching it and not even just not reading, even though I was reading it, but there's moments where I was able to watch the actors and having that time to step away and watching something and to be so drawn in, you automatically begin to listen so keenly. And mm -hmm. that, that, that's powerful sitting in a theater, listening to something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Abs absolutely. A absolutely. People sometimes forget, you know, we have now a, a society where we have much visual imagery, moving imagery, filmic imagery, uh, video. We see videos literally almost every hour on the hour, daily, brand new. And so people for forget sometimes, I believe, how important language is and how powerful how powerful language is. I believe when, when a piece like this comes along and is using, using poetry, using rhythm, using music in such a way, using that combination in such a way to get a message across, uh, 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 an important message, especially a message that is, that is not just saying, oh, kumbaya, love, love, let's all love each other and what have you, but is, that is actually showing a path that one can take to actual steps that one can take to, to break that generational curse as someone was, was calling it earlier uh, in one of the comments. And that's what this is. It's a generational curse. What we're dealing with Talk, because David's talking about slavery. He's talking about the oppression uh, uh, of black people, which by, which extends out to every oppressed peoples on the planet but certainly you know focusing on it on us here and we have a generational curse that we have yet to fully break some of us perhaps have but words how important are words and as a poet dale i know you know you feel their their importance i'm sure you've seen the effects of them in your lot your own personal life so this is this is very important i see we have a, a comment in the in the from the chat room yeah, there's, there's a couple comments. Um, mm -hmm. See, the first comment is repetition can help to drive home the point. I think the repetition was useful. That's from Amadoma. Okay. And then Sabora says, congratulations, David. Dialogue is repetitive in some places and main ideas sometimes get lost, especially in the middle and third act. You may consider trimming, keep the poetic rhythm in the dialogue, be careful of preaching and losing the poetic flow. But great work, everyone, and kudos to all. Thank you mm -hmm. for your comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is a very beautiful comment. Very, very important comment there. Absolutely. One, uh, sometimes when, sometimes it's difficult not to become didactic, you know, and some, some, uh, and that's actually, I believe, never a place that we want to go. You don't want to be didactic. You want to inspire people with your message. You want to pull people in, but 
didactic, being didactic has the, tends to have the opposite effect. So, and it's a fine line sometimes. It's a fine line. So I didn't see, I didn't see necessarily a lot of that there, but I do believe there, I, I thank you for the comment because I think that was a, a very insightful comment there uh, that could help David. Um, our last question that David had for us was, do you feel better after watching this play read? Let's throw that one out there on the table. Actors, do you feel better after having read it? <laughs> after having performed it? Is that yes? And I can everybody? report that there was no no's, so it was all yes. There, there no no's. Okay. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Then that means I, you know, I'm I'm curious to know, I'll throw this out there as well. Did this piece inspire you in any way? I'm getting some head shaking, yeah. Yeah, make you think about things, maybe things that are even have been on your mind already, perhaps that you've been pondering, you know, because I, that, that's something that that this piece brought up for me, I'll say, is that uh, it was actually touching, you know, we're asking about relevance earlier, was touching on things that uh, issues, ideas, concepts that I've been mulling around in my own head, trying to understand, trying to make sense of. And I appreciate any help, any help in that. So this is uh, so this is good. This is good. Let's open up the floor now to any any open comments here. And how are we doing on time, by the way, Kimberly? Are we doing okay on time? I think we're doing okay. I think we have uh, some time if any audience members want to ask any more questions or make comments or anyone from the cast. Yes, please feel free to put your hand up. We're happy to put you on the microphone. Let everyone hear you. We encourage it highly. And it is very helpful to our playwright and to our process here. Anything? It looks like Jacqueline has a question. Aha, excellent. Hello, Jacqueline, hi everyone. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Jeter. Um, Thank you again, David, and also Diana for put, getting me on this project. I'm so happy to be a part of it. Um, just to go back to your question, um, it it did really it made a big difference to me. This was a positive, um, you know, outcome. I'm very happy to have finished the work and to have performed it for everyone. I feel like um, this was something that needed to be done. And also, you know, with everything that David's getting, like with the grants, and everything, I'm very happy about that because now we can perform this again, you know, bigger cast, more people can see this, because I really feel like this is a message that needs to be brought out, not just to my people from my community, but to everyone. Um, I actually am originally from Jamaica, Queens, South Jamaica, Queens, um, like five minutes away from Jamaica Avenue. So this really resonated with me from losing, um, you know, childhood friends, you know, just a year ago, I lost a childhood friend to, you know, gun violence, and they were back in their neighborhood. And, you know, just being able to, I guess, not leave and run away from that, but prosper and become better for those people I have lost and also do this play um, has made a big difference. And it's opened my eyes to not, well, not really open my eyes, but remind me of what, why I keep fighting to stay, to, to be better and, you know, to, to hopefully, you know, provide some type of, I don't know, positive energy to others, make them inspired to do other things because there's so many lost people. And, you know, that, that's another thing with the heckler. I don't personally resonate with him, but I resonate with him through people I know and have loved and have cared about, um, you know, just having that feeling of not loving yourself, not being wanted um, with your own community or outside the community, feeling like an outsider, feeling like you have to fight to survive and that's a lot I know a lot of people who feel like that I know sometimes even we feel like that um, especially in this day and age so I'm just happy that I was able to be a part of something that really made a difference makes people think and you know opens their eyes and I'm really excited to hopefully do it again for more people and really get a message across and hopefully really change you know the way people think especially young black people because there's so many of us that are lost and confused and we need guidance. And that's another reason why I was so happy I got to be Josephine Baker because I feel like she was, you know, a beacon of guys, beacon of hope. She showed strength and just reminded you like, hey, like I didn't do all this, you know, we didn't work hard and, you know, work through all these sacrifices just for you to like, you know, not love yourself, not understand the life you were given can be so much more. So I just love the play. Wonderful. I'm glad we played it. Thank you, Jacqueline. And you were, by the way, um, all of your characters are great, but your Josephine Baker was a knockout. 
<laughs> was absolutely something. Thank you for Thank going you. the extra mile because the look, everything was was really wonderful. Thank uh, you. <laughs> and, and you brought up and you brought up the fact, you know, that Josephine Baker is, was a beacon and and he is her memory, her story is a beacon of light. I found it very interesting, David, the the choices you made in terms of the the heroes, the the, the hero spirits. The, el uh, the elder spirits that you that you resurrected to come out and help to 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 help the heckler uh and it, it josephine baker is i think one of the finest examples of what not just a black person or a black woman can do but just what a human can do period and to so to call upon through the work through the writing to call upon her spirit to you know come down and help show us help illuminate us help guide us here in the darkness it, it was it was just really i found that very resonant uh and, and very lovely and and the way they were handled too david you handled them very beautifully i thought um uh you know you you were absolutely respectful with them but they were real people they were flesh and blood people and that was that was really beautiful i enjoyed the spirit of johnny cochran he was a very interesting character to bring out, you know, the, you know, the most famous, the most famous black attorney prior to Ben Crump, right? Um, and, and quite a man who had a lot of things to say. So to call upon his spirit, because of course, we're dealing with the legalistic aspect of everything as well, when it comes to legal. So that was very, that was very exciting, very interesting. Um, anyone else would like to chime in? Any other thoughts, anything we haven't uh, touched upon here? I just want to say I that. If, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we were just listening. Can you imagine mm -hmm. the visual of what you just, ex what you just described, Garland? Oh, you know, yes. can you imagine the visual, mm -hmm. David, the visual that you've given us? If, if, you know, if we ever do see the visual, it's going to be, whew, it's going to be astounding. Like Wakanda forever. Who knows? You know, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, video is yeah. coming. You're definitely going to see it, Carl. It's, it's definitely video is coming. coming. Okay. Okay. I, hey, I, I'm telling you, it's hot. Thank so, you, man. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree 100%. I feel, you know, this, this work is definitely reaching into those heights for sure. Eric mentioned Shakespeare earlier. I felt, a, I felt that as well uh, as I was listening to it and watching it. And when I was reading it originally and, and bringing up Wakanda, Wakanda forever. I mean, you know, that, that kind of inspiration, you know, is absolutely a message for everyone. So that's that. That's really wonderful. We had some comments I saw in the chat room. I think Peg and Eddie had something to say. Um, yeah, let's see. Ed, Edward said, I also appreciated how David introduced the problem and offers a solution. It was great. Mm -hmm. And then Peg said she loved all the singing and all of you can sing. And um, let's see, I wanted to make a comment uh, mm -hmm. as well, because we're talking about some things that are resonating with me. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, David and the entire cast. We've been working together for a couple of weeks, several weeks. It's really exciting to uh, get to this place. And, you know, as a producer, oftentimes you want to have a, a top and a bottom and a middle. And I want to say we achieved way much more than that. We really created some magic. And, and speaking of spirits, um, I don't know, it must have been in the inner, in the day today, uh, Garland Sr., who was one of the founders of SFWW, his picture appeared on, <laughs> getting emotional about it, on Garland's phone. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. The energy's there. Yes, it was, Kimberly pointed that out to me today that, you know, how the iPhone, you know, with photos they kind of goes through and it has AI and it makes it makes a little movie for you a slideshow for you and so you get it every day the daily slideshow and and today the picture that was sitting on top uh, was a picture of my father Garland Sr. and it did feel you know we lost him in 2014 uh, and there's been a great you know a great hole ever since that of course you know will never fill his shoes but he he will still be there for us but it felt like very much like he was watching over us as we begin our our 50th anniversary journey here of the frank silvera writers workshop um you know for those of you who don't know about the workshop i encourage you please go to our website the fsww.org you can find out some history or google frank silvera or the frank silvera writers workshop and um 
it's an amazing it's amazing history and and i'm proud and honored to still be guiding it and to see him to see him there like that you know lets us know as david is calling up the spirits of the elders right as david is calling up the spirit of josephine the spirit of johnny the spirit of harriet tubman um uh it 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 feels as though dad is here with us as well watching over us and and ironic too that such a a piece with such a message of love you know so that i feel like that's almost like that to me that's like um finding a penny on the way to the bank and what have you it's a good sign right it's a good sign of what what's going to come so that's uh yeah that 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 was a great moment thank you for pointing that out uh for pointing that out kimberly this is um helping pieces along the way like this helping playwrights like david stamps and also in the process providing app opportunities to to um to people like the people we have here today in the cast and our director and the people who've worked so hard these last these last several weeks to pull this together today for us so beautifully um this is this spirit of love that David is that David is is sending out to the world through his work, this message, this is what the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop was about. It was an effort. It began as an effort to to react to what was happening and what had been happening to us as a community as black and brown people, but to react in a way that is thoughtful, that is intentional, that is inspirational, that is a way that will help us find a way out of this generational curse. And this is why we do this with these, with these discussions. Um, and, and this is why we ask these questions. This is why, why we're here. We're asking these questions. We, we want to know because we want to be led out of the darkness. All of us do. All of us want a way out of the darkness, right? So we're all looking for a light. We're all looking for a light, a torch that we can carry, that we can that can show us the way to that light at the end of the tunnel and that into the daylight opening. So uh, it's very meaningful to do this piece, I believe, and it's very meaningful this message. And what we are here to do, and what I hope we've helped David do today, is to help him craft his message, craft his piece, give him information. And all of you have helped, uh, whether you commented today or not, actors, your work, your, your work and our audience members, your comments, your everything you've said and done has given him feedback. Every, every inflection in your voices as you read his words, every, every piece of the emphasis, everything Eric directed you and every every all the help he gave you you know it was it, it was all unified so we're already experiencing that unity so that says a lot to me about this piece right this piece has the power to to do that and that brings us back to the writing to the words and that's what that's what it's about um david i think you said you said definitely you have definitely this has definitely been helping you today oh my right? god this has been so helpful in so many ways first of all hearing it you know, and these actors, you know, we had like two rehearsals. The, every actor here put in 110%. You know what I mean? So it was like, it was okay. You know, it was all right, even though it was just two rehearsals. And then the other part of it was being able to hear the clickety clack. I believe Eric called it an inner rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I could begin to see staging it. That's what I started being able to see when I could see these actors giving me, in other words, when they sent me the energy, that's the energy I was sending back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then also, you know, I also, Garland, you're doing a, such an excellent job of, uh, I don't know what it's called, commentating, moderating, because you're getting some good information from me that's going a little deeper. You know, you, by you probing a bit, I'm really getting to understand things in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's quite, quite informative. Thank you. Excellent. That's that's what we aim to do is to really, you know, it's about, you know, at this stage when a play is being, I mean, I mean, what we're doing is basically we're workshopping this play. Right. So at this stage, it's about it's about, OK, uh, OK, this guy has built this incredible car. 
It's amazing. He's built it from scratch. He engineered everything. He did all the machine work. He built the engine. He built all the pieces. He put it all together. Now it's time for us to get under the hood and really, you know, get in there and really look, and really and see and see, okay, first of all, the beauty that's in front of us, but then how can we make it even more beautiful? How can we push even further? How can we pull even more out of it? Because not just because, oh, sure, that's what we do, but because there's more to be pulled out of it and more that needs to be pulled out of it, you know? And so, and so David, now you've got, you, you've got this team of engineers around you, you know, you've got this team of engineers who've all been looking at this incredible car you've built, <laughs> Right. You know, this incredible solar powered, electric driven, you know, fantastic for the planet car. And they're going, you know, they're letting you hear how this thing sounds. How does it hum? How does it feel on the road? And what have you, you know, so we're road testing. it, And this is the whole this is the whole purpose. This is, you know, in 1973, there really were very few places that black and brown artists, that female artists, women artists that that uh, that that different people of different persuasions, different you know uh, sexual persuasions, etc., could come and bring the car that they built and have a team of engineers look at it. There was no place for that to happen. I mean, if you know, if you were if you were in the majority population, then maybe it was a little bit easier. But even then, not so much. So so that's you know that's part of our mission. That's part of our mission, and that's what. Uh, certainly, I am hoping that uh, the workshop will be able to do for another 50 years <laughs> into the future. And David, this is congratulations on this piece. Congratulations on the grant that you've gotten. Congratulations on the Kennedy Center. This is all beautiful, beautiful uh, to hear. I mean, clearly, the work you've put into it shows. And, uh, you know, you're you're getting the benefit that you should be getting out of it. And God I'm bless. sure that's all. I'm sure that's only the beginning. <laughs> well, it is only the beginning because we do have a question about that. Uh, Janet uh -huh. Marletto says, are you seeking investors? Well, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> the way I'm looking at it now, uh, I'm looking for producers to come on and maybe do a co-production uh, for, um, for the Kennedy Center. But then I'm also looking for producers. Thank you so much, Amanda DeMar. I'm also looking for producers or uh, perhaps for this uh, this immersive experience in, in August, maybe an enhancement, because my thinking is like to bring off Broadway to Queens, you know, sort of thing where, you know, it's really done well, it's really quite an experience, and yet it's still a workshop, you know what I mean? Because the thing about this thing that I really want to be clear on is what it is exactly I'm saying. I'm so glad when Sabora said when well, she got a whole lost in the third part. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's really good to hear the good things, but it's much more important also to hear things that are outside of what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, the dramatic premise is um, when you're in alignment, you're out of harm's way. So now I get to go back to that and I get to work it out again, which is so awesome. I have to say thank you to the Frank Severo Workshop I have to say thank you to Kimberly Gunn. She has been amazing. This entire cast, oh my God, this cast. <laughs> Eric Jordan Young came in with three weeks. I'm telling you, he worked his magic. He has such an understanding of Shakespeare, but is a brother from the hood. It was just the right mix. You know what I'm saying? It was just the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk. I want to say one more thing. Mm -hmm. Please. There's one person here who has been extremely important. I mean, there are a lot of people who've been extremely important in this process. But this young lady was in the hospital room, bandaged up, reading her lines. Can we please give it up for Miss Diana Price? Wow, that day, fantastic! What <laughs> day? Oh yeah, and uh, Chris Barnett cut my hair today. Yeah, homie, I hollered you out. <laughs> Day, I have to ask, how did that feel? How did that feel doing it today like that? <laughs> well, I will say um, I've been out the hospital for only one day while we were mm -hmm. getting all the little Nick bits in. I mm -hmm. was yep, in an EEG, head wrapped fully to a wall. 
um, <laughs> doing it all from my laptop. Um, I've also been the stage manager for this production. So it was a lot of back and forth with all of the, well, stop y'all, stop <laughs> it. But honestly, it's just, I have so much love for David. And when I told you the time that he just handed me his card and said, you're going to be my poetess, I was looking at him like the weirdo on the street. But he has truly come to become like a very close uncle in a way, just like someone who whenever I'm down and out or feeling terrible, he will indeed always pick up that phone. So even if I was in the hospital, I wanted to give that same undying, unfaltering loyalty and love right back at him. And with something that I do enjoy doing too. This is such a beautiful masterpiece. And I say it's freaking amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I had nurses looking over my shoulder, being nosy. And I'm like, no, you can't see the script. Like, no, this is <laughs> top notch secret, <laughs> secret code. Only me and my cast. Mm -hmm. uh, um, mm -hmm. It did get stressful at some times because um with the diagnosis I have, um, emotional trauma does get to it. So sometimes all acting realm sometimes is emotional trauma, <laughs> if not done correctly. But within this play, you just get to, there's literal places where I, as the poetess, get to say, breathe. <laughs> so it's literally written in for the actors of it to be able to breathe and process and keep going mm -hmm. it's just beautiful but thank you so much david for that i really do appreciate it but you know i got you back so. <laughs> that's that's so beautiful you know it, hearing that story makes me think that this this play and its message it's it's inevitable it's already it's being done out there it's being produced etc is almost inevitable because it's already achieving what was talked about in the piece at one minute at one minute you know in the in the last three weeks all of you and the cast eric david kim all of you came together and this piece brought you together these words these powerful words brought us all together and that is something that was not lost on either my father, Morgan Freeman, Clayton Riley, Billy Allen Henderson, the founders, or our our hero, our inspiration, Frank Silvera, who uh, Sabora Rashid, I saw her, Sabora posted in the comments that if you don't know who Frank Silvera is, you really need to look him up. Go ahead and Google him. There's a Wikipedia page, et cetera. You can find out about him. He was the most amazing man, and he believed in the power of the word. Uh, and, and in fact, isn't that what came first? The word, right? First, there was the word, right? So it all comes, it all comes from that. So yeah, I, I, I feel like, David, you are definitely on the right, right track. You are very much to be applauded. You, your work, your hard work, your efforts, your skill and your craftsmanship, um, and not only in your writing, but in the people that you've approached to, to make this piece happen. Um, is is just wonderful is, is is just wonderful so that's good to hear but it's also as you said really good to hear things like what Sabora said about where it might be dragging here and there and there were little places and you know that's why the, i made the comment about being didactic sometimes we can fall into that without even kind of knowing it and we have to kind of go back and look at it and see it but that's uh, kind of fun too you know that whole process mm -hmm. of you know, getting deeper and deeper into it and finding out what it is I'm really trying to say. You know, that's kind of fun. <laughs> I just want to say one well, more yeah. thing. I want to say mm -hmm. one more thing before I stop saying anything else. Uh, okay. You know, uh, if you decide that you want to share this message about the Black Bullet dichotomy, which would make my heart so glad, I would just ask that you begin that conversation with unconditional love. And that you end that conversation be reminding that person and thereby reminding yourself that the law of attraction is always in action. Thank you very much. Mm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Those are wise words. Those are definitely wise words. Kimberly, do we have any other comments? Any other hands up? Anyone else like to uh, jump in and make a quick comment? See, I see that. Edward, did you want to make another comment or did you have a question, Edward Fee? 
Um, actually, <laughs> I could go on forever and I won't. <laughs> but uh, but I would say just quickly, it's funny. I could almost see this as a film. I don't know why. I don't know mm. why. Cause with mm. all the imagery and stuff, you know, I'm sure it could work on stage also. Mm -hmm. But I also could see it as a film, you know. So mm -hmm. just throwing that out there. And I did have a question for David. I don't know if he if he took off, but I was just wondering what what was some some of his writers or his you know where he draws a lot of his inspiration from, or you know specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. But, Thank you, Edward. Maybe oh, I, I can tell you that. Okay, David. I'm sorry. Uh, August Wilson, James okay. Baldwin, Tennessee Williams. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. No, 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 uh, <laughs> no, no slouches there, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, poets all, poets all. That's that's mm -hmm. great. And I think somebody mentioned, I don't know, something else came up. Siddhartha Buddha, Herman Hess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that that mm -hmm. came to mind also. And Shawshank mm -hmm. Redemption. That's one of that's my one of my favorite films. And also, mm -hmm. it's it's big on. Um, I think on. Uh, um, it's one of the, one of the all time favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption, and it deals with redemption, you know. So, mm -hmm. so it's a great a great theme. So, I, one mm -hmm. of my that's all I got for tonight. <laughs> well, thank you, Edward. You know, thank as you. Uh, as uh, as the fact of the matter is that uh, one of our co founders of the workshop stars in Shawshank re, re, uh, Sha, Sha, stars in that film, Shawshank Redemption. Absolutely, oh, oh. I won't mention his name. Yeah, yep. I think I know who you're talking about. Great guy, though. Yeah. Yep, that's one of our that's one of our favorite films as as well. And and uh, I could absolutely see uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Absolutely, it felt because of the journey, the journey that the that the the young man was on, our young poet, our lead character. Uh, it, it definitely felt like that. There was. Mm. It was a message and funny because David alluded to this earlier about using this process to help find him, find out about himself. What is he trying to say? That's what the heckler had to do in order to successfully atone and then bring about yeah. at one minute as he had to become at one with himself. Exactly. First, yes. That's where it starts. If you can't do it with yourself first, you damn sure ain't going to be able to do it with nobody else. So that is the truth. Yeah. And as far as like uh just to be specific too, with the repetition, I was referring because I, I did this as a write, you know, as a writer too. There's the tendency and the beats I'm talking about, not necessarily like with uh poetry, but with the strategies of the different action of the actors, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes the strategies can start to repeat. That that was my my you know, that was the insight I got from when I do writing and stuff too, you know, it mm -hmm. might be a tendency to do that, but the breaking down the beats and the strategies really help to like say, Oh, okay. I see where, you know, I might've fallen into that thing again, sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. just throwing out there constructive, but I'm not rewriting anybody's work. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I, absolutely. We know that, Eddie. As a playwright, I'm sure you've had to deal with that. Thank you, the, Eddie. I totally writer. appreciate it. Not a problem. Yeah. Anytime, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get my play going, so that's okay. One day at a time. <laughs> well, you know, Eddie, feel free to submit it to the workshop if you'd like to do a reading. But uh, that is really great. That's really great feedback. And David, I, I, you clocked that, I think, right? You clocked that, right? Totally, totally. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's love, David. <laughs> well, you know, you have to watch out because when you're using yeah. the different pieces, the different tools, you know, like as in writers, one of the things that I, I'm aware of sometimes when I'm writing is that I'll end up with uh, I'll I'll say the same word five times in in a paragraph, mm -hmm. and I'll I'll have to catch myself and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know. So absolutely, no, that's that's wonderful criticism, um, and co very constructive criticism. Thank you very much. Um. I think we're pretty much. I think we're coming into the coming into our at time. Kimberly, uh, is that about right? Are we it's about right? There is one more comment though. Um, okay, let's hear says, it. I, I am surprised no one mentioned the spirit of the shopkeeper teaching the person who killed him. Thank you for bringing that up because that did that that actually that it was an interesting point because there was a moment where I thought it was very interesting because he didn't. It was like he, he uh, earlier he'd seemed to come be more accepted when speaking to the poetess about it and being getting the message more and more open and being like, oh, yeah, OK, I get it. I'm good. All right. All right. I'm moving in that direction. And then but when faced with the shopkeeper, almost the opposite reaction happened, almost like he jumped back into the in the past. 
uh, and he was there was resistance there. David, was that uh, did you have to wrestle with that a little bit? Was that how, how well, was see, that? The, th the, thing, the thing that I found in my own personal journey was that I would go and and make a shift, but then when I came time to make a shift again, it was the same situation at a deeper level. So where I found myself doing like okay. Okay, here's a here's a situation. Like when uh the beloved shopkeeper says that ease and flow, that uh flow stay with ease and and cause him to toss all those other girls aside. There might be those who would say, Well, why doesn't she just leave him? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, she raised her vibration. Either he was gonna come to her vibration or vibrate out of her life. Mm -hmm. So it's like a deeper level to the same situation as you mm -hmm. revisit it. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Got it. Got it. OK. Almost like, OK, it's not going to necessarily happen in one session. You'll get inspired right. and I'll get you to the next step. But then you still got to take the step after that. Right. And, right. And right. the step after that. OK. OK. That that makes sense. That's uh, that, that's a good point. That's a very good point there. You know, the, the you know, the whole point with all of this, all of this, any kind of storytelling is to be intentional. You know, and that's right. the and, and that's the thing to know is that, um, you know, when you watch a film, for example, everything that's in that frame uh, has been placed there on purpose. Someone has thought about that. Someone has thought about that coffee mug that's sitting on the desk or that lighter or that stereo or whatever, whatever it may be. They thought about that and it's supposed to be there. And that's and that's also what you have to do with the words, with with anything that we're creating. You have to be that intentional. So, David, it's glad. It's really great to hear uh, how you've wrestled, how you've wrestled <laughs> with these things. You know what I mean, and how uh -huh. close it is. How how much has benefited to you? That's also really wonderful to hear as well. Uh, great. Any last any last comments? Any last words before we wrap this up? I I don't see any comments um, from anyone in the in the chat or the Q and A. So. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Really, really appreciate it for spending the Sunday night with us. And um, as Garland mentioned, next week we're doing a play called Witness, uh, same time, Sunday. Next month, right, Kim? Not, is it next Mar week or next month? It's a week from Sunday, which is next month, March 5th. Oh, okay. Yep, 4 o'clock uh, PST, 7 o'clock EST. And uh, you can check the uh, FSWW's website for registration information on that. And we really appreciate everyone hanging around and participating in this wonderful uh, dialogue followed by uh, after a wonderful play reading. So, and thank you, Garland, for your moderation skills. Any final thoughts, Garland? Uh, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to our entire cast, everyone. You are all brilliant and you all brought so much love to it. So thank you so much. Thank you again to Eric Jordan Young, our wonderful director. Eric, you are doing such wonderful things, such just massive things too out in the world. And the more I hear about it, the more I love it. So just keep on going, brother. No, no, we got your back here at the, here at the uh, Frank Silvera Writers Workshop. You'll always have a home. You are all now part of the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop family. Uh, I encourage you all, if you are playwrights yourselves or you know playwrights, you know people who are interested, who could benefit from this process, we're keeping it virtual for the moment still. And we are, you know, but we are, will be coming back live in New York um, at some point. But in the meantime, we can still get great benefit from this process that we're doing, too. So I highly encourage you to let folks know they can submit to us and we will be happy to get them in the queue and get them a reading. Um, Eric, again, congratulations. Good luck to you on everything that you're doing out there. You're doing some brilliant work. So thank you. Keep on doing it. Uh, thank you to Kimberly Gunn and our Zoom Catchers team uh, for producing the reading and handling all of our tech issues. Thank you to the Billy Holiday Theater, of course, who is our wonderful partner and helps us put these on. We couldn't do this without them. So thank you to the Billy Holiday Theater. Please, if you get a chance, support them, throw them a couple of bucks, you know, uh, give them a donation, go to their website, you know, or, or just head on down to Fulton Street and catch one of the things that they're doing down there. So we love the Billy Holiday Theater. Uh, and uh, again, this is the beginning of our 50th anniversary, Frank Silvera 50 anniversary journey we will be celebrating this through 2025 when we'll end up with a nice big bang and uh, we're going to keep on so stick with us keep an eye out on the socials um, say nice things about us like us if you get a chance <laughs> um, and uh, with that I just want to thank you and thank you of course to everyone who showed up to watch the reading tonight everyone who stuck with us virtually and all the folks who have stuck with us through the through the critique session here. Um, you all are wonderful. Uh, again, 
we do this for the playwrights, we do this for the artists, we do this for the actors, but we also do this for the audience because you're the real change makers. You're the ones whose hearts we're trying to move because you're the ones that are going to go out there and do what you do in your daily lives and you're going to change the world. So without you, the audience, we couldn't do what we do. So thank you very much to our audience. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful good night and uh, we'll see you all next Sunday. Same bad time, same bad channel. Good night, everyone. Good night.